Live from the Talking Joe Studios. It's Talking Joe. Talking Joe is on the air. Hey, 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 it's me, Mark. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. I will be your host today, bringing you a fresh dose of G.I. Joe straight from the Cobra Casino fridge, which we haven't seen in a little while. If you're new to the show, you can find out all of the details over at the website, which is talkingjoe.co.uk. Now, today is very exciting because we will be looking at G.I. Joe a Real American Hero, issue 300, released 19th of October 2022. It's G.I. Joe 300, everybody. It's a heavily stylized issue portraying a battle between a cloned army of 300 snake eyes who are outnumbered by a cobra army, uh, but they somehow triumph. And joining me, as always, it's a real Spartan Tim. How are you, sir? I'm I'm glad you included that word for that that qualifier for my name because I think your your joke was close enough to the actual issue and your delivery <laughs> pleasantly dry that some of our audience may not have thought you were joking and may have thought that you were actually describing the plot of issue 300. Hello Mark, hello listeners, I'm good. Good. Uh, yes, I was referring to the comic book graphic novel by Frank Miller, 300. Yes. So uh, I had some uh, other business from the, the last episode. Do you remember we were talking about that cool cover from uh, SL Gallant, which is those those sort of scrawled doodles by Cobra Commander on a piece of paper? Yes. And, and you said that you thought it might be divisive, that some people might love it and some people might hate it. I put that to the test to try and find out what the listeners thought. And I ran two polls, one on Facebook and one on Instagram. On Facebook, we had 20 votes. 75% said they love it. 5% said they hate it. And 20% were on the fence. Uh, And on Instagram, I gave it a choice of two, cool or not. And we got a 75% cool. So uh, the consensus, at least among those who voted there, uh, is a hit. Interesting. Interesting. I would not have guessed. Hmm. Yes, I guess we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about this comic from the previous episode. We can talk about the new issue for the current episode. Exactly. But yeah, you know me. I'd, I'd love to talk for another 20 minutes about that cover. <laughs> The the other little bit of news ahead was that um, there was there was an interesting interview from Roy from Growing Up Eighties, uh, and he on I think it was Twitch or something like that interviewed Larry Hammer uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, where he updated that he has finished writing three hundred two, and by my counting, uh, the earliest we could get a, a GI Joe comic from the new publisher would be in March, because we've seen February solicits now. Um, So if he was to continue a pace of writing one a month, by the earliest that the next issue came out in in March, he should have already have uh, about six or so issues in the bag. That assumes that everything goes right. (laughs) That that Larry doesn't, uh, that Mm. Hama doesn't, you know, catch a cold or... Uh, you know, we have heard from in, in some of our episodes, you know, when you're dealing with a licensor, you know, you send the artwork or the script or the cover to get approvals. And sometimes, you know, what should be a one or two day turnaround is a lot longer and then a book falls behind. Or if you have lead time, you use up your lead time or, mm. you know, the penciler now has to draw a, an issue much faster or the letterer and colorist have, you know, two days. So Yes, it would look like in an optimistic take that uh, the new publisher is banking some issues. Mm. But in comics publishing, you know, schedules only slip. You know, yeah. you, you tend not to have, you know, very rarely do you have a Brian Michael Bendis and a Mark Bagley who both, you know, Bendis can write five books a month. Bagley can draw two. And so they, you know, they say to Marvel, uh, we'd like to do twice as many issues of Ultimate Spider-Man for the next six months. And Marvel says, mm. okay. Or Marvel says, hey, do you think we could do an extra issue every few months? That'll just make us more money. And Bendis and, and Bagley say, we can do more than one every few months. 
<laughs> yeah, but I was and I was thinking as well that that this this approach to kind of banking a few scripts and building up a little bit of a buffer um, can only be helpful as well if their if their new publisher brings on board um, an art team who require more than a couple of weeks to to turn around the book. So I don't think very few artists outside of Bagley and uh, S. L. Gallant can turn around an entire issue in two weeks so yeah i think that buffer will be helpful yeah one of the other things that has changed in comics in the last 30 40 50 years is that you know in the 50s and 60s many artists could draw more than one book a month you know jack kirby was famously penciling you know three or four books a month uh at marvel and then dc and uh, there are many artists who were either because they were doing breakdowns and an inker was, quote, finishing the art or just because they were very fast because they had to be because the page rates weren't great and there weren't royalties yet. And what has changed in the intervening 30, 40 years is that artists, many of them want to draw more and more detailed uh, readers and editors have come to expect that or at least appreciate it. And in some cases, page rates have gone up. But, you know, sort of the average comic artist these days can do, you know, four or five or six issues in four or five or six months, but not really. Like they start to slide or, you know, the publisher has a either a fill-in artist or the next arc artist already sort of picked out so that they can keep that monthly schedule. They, you know, many artists want, particularly if they're penciling and inking nowadays, they want five weeks or six weeks to do an issue. And that's that's fine. Okay. Another thing from the interview with Growing Up 80s was was an idea that uh, I tried to eke out in our chat with Larry, which was about to what extent some of those he's thinking about some of the stories um, when he's not actually sat down at his desk physically writing the the scripts, and they and and he sort of said that he sort of takes little notes in his heads and files it away, and they talked about this i this this concept of ideas percolating, and and the example they specifically had was coming up with the hexagram in in 21 not necessarily knowing what to do with it and then explaining it in 26 so i guess the the kind of the implication of that really being that yeah these these ideas do sort of live and percolate in between times and will present themselves sort of later later on it isn't necessarily a i can entirely sort of I'll only I'll, I'll only think about this script when when i'm sat at my desk thinking about the next page um, which it feels entirely logical. Yeah, I think you were you were specifically curious about sort of a physical notebook or or typed notes. And mm, uh, I think I might have said that. Yeah. Uh, maybe you said something like it, and I I imagined the difference between like mental notes and physical notes. But you know, some people are really visual in how they think, and uh, and in our interview with Hama, he, you know, he he said he he sees he sees the comic he's writing as a movie in his head. Uh, and so he has the brain power to also file away these ideas. And I guess I hope not lose them because I, I certainly lose ideas when I file them away in my head. So I have post-it notes <laughs> uh, yeah. on my closet door and, you know, on my, I, I've, you know, pages devoted to like, here's an idea for later in my sketchbook. Sometimes I send myself an email or I text my wife and the text to my wife starts with note to self. <laughs> Very good. Um, so today we are talking about uh, issue 300 just out this very week at the time of recording. It was brought to us by writer Larry Hammer, artist S.L. Gallant, inks Maria Keane, colours Jay Brown, letters Neil Utaki, Editor Riley Farmer, group editor Tom Waltz, and research specialist Diana Davis. Um, worth n noting, I guess, that this is a consistent team that we have had really for the last 10 issues, bar the fill in issue from uh, Andrew Griffith. So that in itself is, is something somewhat to be celebrated. Yeah, that has a nice feeling. And not that one has to make this choice, but if I could have something a little less uh, flashy or exciting, or in this case, something that's rushed, you know, we know that Shannon 
Gallant has not had sort of the normal amount of time to pencil these issues. I would rather these issues all get that consistency rather than, you know, two of the issues drawn by Jim Lee and then three of them drawn <laughs> by the normal teen and then one draw by drawn by like, you know, like someone's dog with their eyes blindfolded <laughs> and like their left hand, right? In in a day, consistency counts for a lot in in the monthly grind of comics. You know, if GI Joe was not a monthly comic but was, you know, like an annual graphic novel, that would, you know, I would have a different, you know, and, you know, 10 issues with a almost completely consistent team. I also like with G.I. Joe because that looks back to other runs on G.I. Joe. The earlier Shannon Gallant run, particularly. But, you know, the you know all the people who drew the book when it was at Marvel who, you know, stuck around for more than, you know, eight issues. Yeah. And, and I mean, in terms of this run finishing up as, as well, just to, to have the the most consistent team coming back in particular SL Gallant doing the the pencils you know he's done close to 100 issues on this this run of 155 up to to 300 you know just that in itself i think is is a it's it just feels very cool i think that that he's coming back to to finish it up, off there's there's probably a better word to describe it just the feeling of you know that that um you know, resolution, that consistency. I think of it as I, I've had many thoughts about 300 coming into 300. And I think editor Tom Waltz made a reasonable and calculated and smart decision that, you know, th this book absolutely has to ship on time because, it, you know, we thought that the final day of the license that IDW has with Hasbro for G.I. Joe comics might be the last day of 2002. We're not sure. But whatever the, the, the deadline is, you know, once that legal obligation is over, IDW cannot make and sell any more G.I. Joe comics. And so, you know, the final issue must come out on time, whatever the date for on time is. And uh, Gallant has such a consistent track record of getting issues done in a pinch, and they always look good. Some of them, mm -hmm. some of his issues look great. You know, like the last issue, that, the, the two issues that he did, or the, the one or two issues that he did in the last few years where he also inked, I, I particularly liked. So I think it is both a a reasonable, both compromise and also strategic decision from editor Tom Waltz, right? Because if you... You know, let's let's say it's like, oh, let's get everyone back who's done an issue for IDW and they can all do half an issue, right? Leading up to the final issue. That's a lot more work to make sure everyone's got the script and everyone's got reference. And if someone, you know, that's that's someone who might have more questions and someone who only did one issue like a year or two ago may not have the familiarity with some of the characters, but you know, Gallant has the fam familiarity. And also has been drawing these issues anyway, so it sort of keeps building on itself. Secondly, I also feel like having him do the final run of almost 10 issues is kind of a reward, sort of for loyalty and out of loyalty. You know, you have been the G.I. Joe guy. As we go out, you're going to be the G.I. Joe guy. And I think that's really cool. And my only regret, and this feels very, you know, <laughs> this feels very of, of a piece with G.I. Joe and licensed comics and the monthly grind of comics and the monthly grind at Marvel in the 80s where G.I. Joe was a comic. My only regret is that Gallant goes out doing good work, consistent and good work on a, on a rough deadline. And so if someone's checking back in with the series as it ends, they may not be seeing his best work because he didn't get sort of the full amount of time and by comparison, when there are other artists drawing this book next year at another publisher, the difference may may stand out more. You know, someone might cynically say, oh, well, the IDW book didn't look very good, but this new book from this other publisher looks really good. I'm so glad it changed. So with my with my magic wand, it's like, uh, maybe maybe have someone do a, another fill in, you know, for two ninety nine, and then Gallant can do can actually spend a, norm, a normal amount of time for three hundred, particularly since it was oversized. But yeah. uh, I I think it I think it worked out well considering all the challenges. 
And, and I think if, if someone was to do that, I think the fair comparison would be to say, look at issue 283, Murder by Assassination issue that he did and inked himself where there was, I guess, you know, where, where he had, I guess, the, the more room to properly fulfill his own artistic vision in, in terms of both penciling and inking and also probably having a little bit more time to, to do that, though. I'm sure at the same time it was probably quicker than than he would have liked. Yeah, I I don't know that any new publisher would be interested in bringing back anyone from artistically from the IDW era because, you know, flavor, style, wanting to make their own mark. Mm-hmm. But I think if if anyone deserves, finger quotes, deserves to do a backup, uh a special and get the normal amount of time and offer to and an offer to also ink it. It's Shannon Gallant at whatever the new publisher is. Yeah, if you know the new publisher a few years in from now, they decide to do a, for example, a flashback issue set during this one five five to three hundred era, and they got him back to do a few pages for the flashback or an entire issue or something like that. Uh, I think that would be the you know incredibly delightful and uh, and ho- hopefully this isn't it for Shannon and uh, GI Joe that we'll see some sort of return eventually. But let's let's get on to the the covers. There's a lot of them, so so we'll probably have to be a bit brisker than we normally are. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> so let's get started. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, and we we did a whole episode about cover A. Yeah. So let's let's make the point that if you want to hear more about Jamie Sullivan and cover A, there is uh, an episode which was you know had a lot of time devoted to that uh, Talking Joe episode one seven six, uh, where we had an, a long interview with uh, Jamie and sort of delve a bit more into the detail on that one. Uh, technically, not just cover A, but also cover. D E F G, uh, the the one in fifty, which is the same as cover A, except it it's a virgin cover. It doesn't have the logo, uh, so mm-hmm. you can see a little bit more background in the top left. So a pop fact about the Jamie Sullivan um, cover as well that it's going to be a record breaking cover because it's got over three hundred uh, distinctive individual characters on it on a monthly book. Uh, the the previous record holder for that was uh, an issue of Deadpool. The, the wedding issue, um, which was since retroactively superseded by the cover to G.I. Joe America's Elite issue 25 by uh, Chris Lai, um, which came out in May 2007. This That featured 236 characters, not counting animals such wow. as Order, Max and Spirit uh, and Spirit's Eagle. So uh, now, now, when you say that the Jamie Sullivan record-breaking cover has over 300 characters, it's not that it's 300 characters for issue 300. It's that the number 300, whatever it is, 307, 312, is more than the previous record holder. Yes, yeah, I think it's something like 313 characters on this cover, off the top of my head, and so that, that beats the, the previous record holder of 236. So. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a formal announcement at some point when they update the Guinness World Records uh, page with uh, showing this result. Just some quick things that I'll say about this. It's a lot of fun. I think that as Sullivan said to us in that episode, that after he did the five connecting covers of all the Joes and the five connecting covers of all the Cobras, where he drew everyone on those Bristol pages together and found it, hard and time consuming, he decided he would draw everyone separately for 300 uh, and then um, composite them in Photoshop. I think having having now he, him done that and me seeing the reaction, I would have rather he had drawn everyone together, though it might seem sort of impossible. And I think it's possible that it's still easier to have, you know, a thousand layers in Photoshop for this one image. When I look at this cover, the effect of it, that it's sort of every character all together, is really fun, and I love getting lost in this cover. But when I start to sort of pay attention to it, uh, two things jump out at me. One, everyone is sort of looking straight, and we are looking straight at everyone. Everyone is drawn as if 
they're standing right in front of us and we're not two steps below them or two steps uh, higher them, higher than them. But on this cover, once you get past the one, two, three, third or fourth tier of the crowd, those people are all significantly higher than us, but they're all drawn at a perspective where we're looking at them straight. And so I see a little bit of a disconnect in the in the perspective. We should be looking up at most of the characters on this cover. Um, but again, it, it is it is super fun and uh, it's it's sort of a joy. And I was very happy on Tuesday night prepping the store for Wednesday, my store, the store that I own. We have a, a section of window that is reserved for five or six or seven new issues this week. And the other window sections are generally for graphic novels. And I got to put both the front cover and the back cover of 300 cover A next to each other. So people could see the whole thing from the window. Trivia, uh, trivia quiz for you, Mark. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to make a uh, make up a jingle of this. <clears throat> dun, 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 dun. Duke punching cover commander. Duke punching cover commander. When has it happened before this time? Okay. When have we seen, Mark, on a G.I. Joe cover, very specifically... Duke and Cobra Commander facing off, not like standing sort of near each other in a movie poster montage, but specifically fighting each other, if not someone punching. And, oh. and uh, w- when have we recently seen on a cover Duke punching Cobra Commander? Well, now you said the word recently, and I think that <laughs> that's that's uh, that's us being old and things which are a long time ago now seeming more recent. Issue 200. Very good. Very good. That is that is part of the answer. Uh, yes, yes. There are Mark. There are four covers in the last several years where on a GI Joe, a real American hero cover, Duke and Cobra Commander have been facing off. So yes, on the cover to two hundred, they're facing off on what is that? A hiss mark seventy five. A hiss mark eight eight thousand three hundred. There have been a lot of hisses. It's the one named after the film. Yeah, is it called a retaliation hiss? Hiss, might be. Okay, cover to 200, Duke and Cobra Commander specifically squaring off with weapons. Cover to 225 by Shannon Gallant uh, in the foreground in front of a big fight. And this is a wraparound cover. Uh, Duke and uh, Cobra Commander are about to hit each other and punch each other. The, uh, The subscriber cover, cover B of 230, is a John Royal cover where Duke and Cobra Commander are... Uh, falling out of an exploding rattler. Um, okay, and then very recently, actually, mm. uh, the cover to 292, the retailer incentive cover, is Duke punching Cobra Commander. And it is drawn by Gary Kissel, or or Jerry Kissel, excuse me. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you'd think that there have been a ton of G.I. Joe covers where Duke and Cobra Commander are actually fighting each other. There aren't. There are a ton of G.I. Joe covers where the main four or five Joes and the main four or five Cobras are running at each other or running at us or a bunch of movie poster style heads. And a fifth previous cover where Duke is specifically squaring off with Cobra Commander appears not in G.I. Joe or Real American Hero, but in G.I. Joe Saturday Morning Adventures, (laughs) issue number four, which came out just this past summer, this is the animated book, the book that looks like the cartoon. Uh, and in this case, Duke and Cobra Commander are fighting over the genie's lamp. All right, so cover B for issue 300 is the fifth and final part of Jamie Sullivan's uh, All of the Cobra Command uh, Connecting Covers cover. Destro and the Iron Grenadiers are uh, spotlighted here. It's great. And then we've also got some... We have a Red Shadow. Who's the guy with the red... Is that a, that's, a, that's an Iron Grenadier. Who's the guy with the red beret on the left with the long coat? I knew you were going to ask me that. I've looked it up before. I think he's is, called he, something like Major Duncan. Is he from a fan club or G.I. Joe convention box Wow, well, I can't believe that I got that right. Yeah, he was released, uh, bagged in the Iron Grenadier Ground Assault 2-pack with Darklon at the 2012 International G.I. Joe convention in New Orleans. Great. All right, cover C uh, is uh, drawn by Nitho Diaz, and it is the five or so most popular Joes uh, running at the five or so most popular uh, Cobras. What's neat about this is that everyone is doing something sort of different, how they're running forward, how they're 
uh, kicking or lunging or what weapon they're using or uh, which hand uh, they're favoring. A lot of excitement in this cover. And then there's a big sort of, uh, there's a big lightning strike uh, happening. <laughs> there is. In the middle, sort of from the top of the cover behind the logo. Um, and there is a uh, sort of fire and or explosion on the bottom right, sort of behind the Baroness, sort of behind her in the sort of off camera in the scene. And I thought that if this comic book could only have a single cover with no variants, maybe this would be the one. This sort of gets my, it's not a prize, this sort of gets my pick. It's like, okay, if we had to pick the covers that did get drawn for this issue, if we could only use one, and it could only be sort of a regular front cover and not a wraparound. Uh, yeah, quick one on that one. That originally, I believe, Cobra Commander was drawn with a hood, aha, uh, and with co with um, the Hasbro Veto on the hooded Cobra Commander. I believe that that was requested to be changed to the helmeted uh, Cobra Commander. And unusually, Stalker is using an AK forty seven, a rifle, not traditionally. right. Uh, associated um, with him although there is, there is a lot of use of that particular weapon in this particular issue so maybe not so strange i i i got the the sort of sense that this cover um i don't think that this is necessarily cobra island or a volcano it, it could just be sort of you know the rocks where joe's and cobras pose for these kinds of covers a lot of time covered a 225 for example um the the red background sky color and the uh, explosion behind uh, the Baroness and under Mindbender on the right do put me in the mind a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of not just a battle and, and, and ordinance going off, but, you know, there's a lightning strike. So something a little bit in the direction of a volcano. Cover D is drawn by Kieran McCown uh, with colors by Louis Antonio Delgado. Uh, this cover sort of inadvertently looks back to the Tony Salmon's cover for issue 88, uh, inked by Randy Emberlin, where you have uh, four Joes on the left facing off against four jo uh, Cobras on the on the right, and it's just heads. Uh, and this is not quite that. This has a, di a different composition. This has five Joes on the left and four Joes on the right, but they're split between the top and the bottom. What's great about this cover is that McCune draws everyone with different facial structures. Everyone has a different nose, different lips, different eyes. Uh, everyone's nose or uh, mouth is a different height, sticks out a different amount. So these are these are really specific, not just characters but people. Uh, and there's there's really solid inking here. There are, you know, some bold thick lines. A little unusual that Gung Ho has blonde eyebrows and a blonde handlebar mustache, but I'll allow it. <laughs> also very cool that it's not just that these faces are drawn well and distinctly. There's so much character and acting in these faces, right? Roadblock is tough. Duke is uh, focused. The Baroness is knowing. Um, Mindbender is sneering just with his eyes, right? Destro is superior, right? Like This is an amazing drawing. And I sure wish this person would come back and do some more covers. Uh, the next cover is, this is now a uh, a variant. This was uh, for every 10 copies of, of any of A through D that a store ordered. They could order one of these. This is uh, John Royal and Jagdish Kumar with colors by James O'Frady. This is the counterpoint to the issue 299, one in 10 retailer incentive cover, which was Cobra Commander standing in front of a bunch of heads, which alludes to an old John Byrne Fantastic Four cover, right? Yep. So here's Hawk in front of a bunch of Joe heads. And uh, we can see uh, Royal probably has some oddball favorites because based on who shows up and how big their heads are. So I'm going to guess that Royal likes Airtight and Red Dog <laughs> because if we've seen Red Dog on a cover, like, is he, is he on the cover to A? 300A? Let's look next. to Yes, he is. We've never seen him this big on a cover. <laughs> exactly. He's he's only ever been just a face on a on a massive group shot. Cover F is uh, a 1 in 25 realer, retailer incentive variant cover. It's drawn by Ron Joseph with colors by Jay Brown. This one is fun for several reasons. It's got three original 13 Joes plus 
I'm going to guess, some favorites from Ron Joseph, uh, because you tend not to get Torpedo and Snowjob on just sort of random covers, plus the Sky Striker. Uh, they're in the water, uh, or just by the water, at Ellis Island. Statue of Liberty is behind them, and then there's an American flag sort of design motif uh, behind all that. This is fun because it's it's a it's a scene, you know. I mean, I, I like the John Royal cover with a guy with a bunch of heads around him, but I'm I'm always happy to see backgrounds and some sort of reckoning of physical space, you know, a, a ground plane, something higher up, whether it's a wall or a mountain or a desert. And then cover, um, uh, Ron Salas drew a cover, which is uh, an online exclusive for the IDW website. And I believe, Mark, this is where you queue up. So I reached out to Ron Salas uh, to to hear what he had to say about this cover. And uh, very kindly, he got back to us. So this is what he had to say. Hi, this is Ron Salas, and I'm the artist for the G.I. Joe number 300 online exclusive cover. Uh, now, I, first off, I just want to say that I've been a big fan of G.I. Joe. I've been a big fan ever since I was a kid. It was one of the first comic book series that I always that I ever got into. Um, and I've, you know, had the toys, watched the cartoons, the movies and everything. So I've been a big fan for many years. Now, I've not really been hiding this fact. Um, so at some point, uh, somebody, Justin from IDW, contacted me about doing some work for them. And it turned out to be this cover. Now, IDW gave me a few different ideas. Uh, one of them was this montage of the most iconic characters of G.I. Joe. And I thought, you know, I... No, I could do this. I could pull this off. Um, and I hope you guys agree. The process is pretty simple. You know, I did everything. Pencils um, and colors. So, you know, um, this cover, um, I drew it pencil and ink on actual paper. And I scanned it and colored it in Photoshop. Um, that's basically it. I mean, it's not really anything complicated. Um, but I hope you like this cover. And, um, you know, I hope you guys enjoy the book. Thank you to Ron Salas for that. That's great. Everyone, please check out Ron Salas, S-A-L-A-S dot com, or Ron Salas on Twitter, or Ron Salas on Instagram, or Ron Salas on Dribble. Crikey, what's Dribble? I don't know. <laughs> uh, what can you tell us about Ron Salas, Tim? Well, Mark, Ron Salas is Philippine-born. He studied in uh, Florida. He's in Virginia now, and he's done work for a variety of clients. Uh, he's done some comics work, and I really like the color in this cover, right? The color is really the star, right? There's there's some nice compositional work with this um, forced perspective on Snake Eyes' sword, and I'm always happy to see uh, Roadblock's sec uh, 1986 costume drawn sort of... Huh, yeah all the way that it's supposed to be drawn, not sort of combining it with any other costumes. But the the uh, yellow, orange, and sort of, you know, pink, violet of the explosion and then Cobra Commander in the back really nicely sort of matches against the very pink uh, and, and, and warm um, Dr. Mindbender and Baroness in the foreground. And then the Joes are, are their colors are sort of less editorialized more sort of realistic or local uh it's a it's a pretty cover lastly there's a one in 50 retailer incentive cover uh which is cover a again uh without uh, the logo in the top right there there is one more cover tim which you've not yet oh mentioned. that's right uh uh nerf you you handle this one <laughs> yeah this is the nerf variant so so i don't think this is going to be out until next year when the nerf blaster uh, comes out so this is a gi joe decoed uh, nerf gun and uh, uh, amazingly it will come with an exclusive cover by dave johnson uh, featuring sort of gi joe's in a bit of an homage to issue one jumping out and uh, you know firing 
uh, nerf guns at us, the audience. Uh, so yeah, a lot of fun and some <laughs> comic comic completists who def you know will have to have this variant uh, going to be seeking out a uh, a nerf gun at the same time. So um, <laughs> good luck to you. That's interesting in that 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 is an IDW comic book that will be sold next year when we think maybe idw technically lo no longer has the license so i wonder if there's some deal where idw has already printed those and those are already mm. going to wherever the nerf gun is uh, uh sort of assembled or pa uh, packaged you know because that would yeah come quite, in the, quite in the box yeah. So, so now that we've talked about uh, what happens on the front of the comic, let's talk about the inside and remind everybody with a plot breakdown. In Dr. Mindbender's lab on Cobra Island, a clone Snake Eyes has broken free from his tank. He has been programmed to be loyal to Cobra, but seeing Scarlet's throwing stars embedded in the wall behind him seems to somehow break him free. He launches a berserker mode Viper killing spree. Above Cobra Island, the Joes overhear Cobra's chatter. Scarlet and Stalker parachute down to rescue the clone Snake Eyes. They rendezvous with the still alive Wade Collins and Storm Shadow, who are mid battle in the jungle. Elsewhere, Alpha 001 orders the return of the modified casino bats back to their Baton Rouge base. Laura, Sean, Dawn and Cobra Commander meet up with the another G.I. Joe team in the Whale before they converge with the other Joes. This larger Whale team access the lab via a loading bay door at the back of the lab, rescuing the clone Snake Eyes. Reunited, Snake Eyes and Scarlet embrace. With Cobra on the ropes, Serpent or Khan prepares to use the mutant zombie bomb. Meanwhile, in the skies above Cobra Island, the remaining casino bot destroys one of the C-130's engines, leaving the plane in an uncontrolled spin, heading for a crash landing on Cobra Island. To be continued in issue 301 from a new publisher. Fingers crossed, we hope. Mark, I was... Do we, have, do we just have to start with the final page? <laughs> that's one way of starting or we could hold off what do you what do you want to do yeah I, I i we can go there we can we can go there i think um i was like i was super excited to to get uh 300 i went and bought a digital copy of uh 300 the morning of release so i could read it almost immediately after I'd woken up um, and I've been to the comic shop today to buy to get my physical copy as well so I've, I've shelled up out twice for this one and yeah I was I was, I was very excited to see I sort of uh, you know more than ever I think sort of pl plugged into the excitement of having a new issue coming out of G.I. Joe so so that's kind of my I bet guess big positive that uh, that level of excitement to see actually what is is in there and it kind of was exactly what I expected it to be, but also nothing like I expected it to be. <laughs> mm. <laughs> if that makes sense. Wait, so, let's, let's let's come back to that sentence because I yeah. I think I think I have a version of that too. So um, so I read this Tuesday night. One of one of the advantages <laughs> of owning a comic book store is you can you can't sell or display stuff until it's available for release, but. I can take it home and read it. Uh, so I took it home and uh, I said to the missus, uh, I'm just going to sit down and read the first page of this. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I'll read it later. Uh, very excited. I, I did tell Mark I was going to read it as soon as I could. Uh, usually with Real American Hero issues, uh, I read it not the day it comes out, but a few days later, closer to when we record the episode about it. So it's very fresh. And uh, I read the whole thing. And I chuckled once or twice, sort of the like anxious gasp chuckle, the the oh my gosh uh, chuckle, and it both moves the story ahead. the The comic book itself does a, a new thing or two for GI Joe, but the main story, the the thirty page Larry Hama story, it turns out to my great surprise, was not a final issue. Hmm. And when I spoke with Hama 
in March or April, uh, he came to Boston for a convention and we met up. And I was not trying to get spoilers or have him sort of tell me what was going to happen. But I did think sort of as a writer, he could explain how we, he was going to approach it sort of uh, philosophically. And I said something like, um, do you know what you're doing for 300? Or I think at that, this was March, right? Or April. So I think you know, 292 had come out, 293, right? He, he would have been writing, I don't know, 296. And I said, do, do you know what you're doing? And, and the question was sort of, since you have a final issue coming up, does it make sense for you to do some planning ahead, even though you don't plan ahead? You, you make it up one page at a time as you go along, but surely for a final issue, you wouldn't be writing, you know, page 26 of a 30 page comic, not knowing what happens on page uh, 27. And he said, uh, and then I believe he said a version of this pretty soon after at another convention. Uh, he said, uh, well, basically I'll, I'll do what I did in 155, where sort of they close up shop. And that way, if it becomes available again, they get reactivated. And, and I thought, that's interesting because, you know, you and I talked about sort of having the toys available for the next writer. Um, and uh, I also thought, yeah, I don't know if I want a final issue of G.I. Joe to be the final story. You know, I don't know if I, don't know if I want Larry Hama's final G.I. Joe comic to be like some characters retire, someone dies, someone's uh, decommissioned, Cobra Commander and the Brass are in jail or executed or die on the battlefield. I think I want the final Larry Hama G.I. Joe story to be a lot like other, you know, where I have some sense that the story continues. Mm -hmm. And he certainly, in my book, finger quotes, deserves to write a final issue where there is no more story, whether or not, you know, another writer were to pick up this continuity. Um, but I thought, and then, and then later at this sort of convention that happened, I think pretty soon after, he said, I'm not going to kill anyone in the final mm. issue. And that, that's not a convention I went to. I think that, I think you quoted that, Mark, when we did a podcast soon after that, because we've been checking in with sort of, you know, what Hama has said about the finale and anything that might come after since the announcement. Um, so I thought this issue was going to wrap up the story that uh, the Joes would get Cobra Commander or not quite get him, but, you know, the civilians on Cobra Island would sort of be okay. The Joes would get out of there, or we'd at least see them sort of heading home and that we can assume they're going to get home okay. And that they'd get back to the base and it would be, you know, sort of locked up. I assumed that Hama was going to very, very briefly wrap up the Blue Ninja story. And I did not expect in issue 299 or this issue 300, Snake Eyes to come back. Because Indeed. I think I've been counting. Yeah. I think I think I've been counting. I think three times in the letters page since two thirteen, Hama has said, No, he's dead. He's not coming back. Hmm. And so I have I have two thoughts on this. One, if he's going to bring him back, it's gotta, you know, sort of be awesome and and emotionally resonant. Because now with three snake snake eyes that's running around, it feels like uh you know, you have Wolverine and his son and his clone daughter and interesting stories have been told about all of those characters. I like all of those other characters and I like Throwdown and I like Don Marino. But, you know, was Wolverine more interesting in the 70s and 80s when it was just him and you didn't know a lot about him? Is Snake Eyes sort of more special when he's he's the one cool silent guy in black who can take down anyone? It's like, well, don't forget, there's also Throwdown who's silent, all in black and is learning to take down anyone. So, uh, and and then, and I certainly did not expect, I certainly did not expect a cliffhanger on the final page of this issue. And and I, that's when I sort of chuckled out loud, sort of like a anxious, blurting out, relief, surprise, guffaw. Like, and then I realized, which I had known all along, but I hadn't, it, I hadn't felt it yet. Oh, I don't know when this is getting picked up. Maybe March, maybe June. 
<laughs> and, you know, Hama has done cliffhangers before where he picks up a moment later. And he's done cliffhangers before where he picks up like an hour later. And I assume the first page of 301 from a different publisher is going to pick up on this moment and this thread. <laughs> but maybe not. Yeah, I mean, in his chat with us and also in his interview with Michael Kelly that he did for, for Hasbro, he, he pretty much said as much as he was going to end it on a cliffhanger and actually spelled it out to us as well that it was it was a cliffhanger of the Joes in the C-130s, you know, coming down to, to their potential doom and that he didn't know how it would be resolved until he gets to the next issue, but it will be picked up in 301. So... Uh, I am expecting when we see 301 that if he has his way and isn't trumped by uh, the new publisher's editorial, that it would be very much the the next split second of the adventure. So did Hama say at at some point in the last few months of interviews or convention appearances, did he say, he did say this, right? That his plans for 300 changed when the news of a new publisher hit i i i definitely get that Im- impression i don't know to what extent it's really had you know a firm pin put into it just to to really you know set that in stone but that's certainly the the impression that i get that his plan for 300 changed once he knew that there was going to be a 301 because if I'm if I'm remembering to March or April correctly, and I think I am, he said to me that 300 was an end, mm. and he didn't say, "Oh, there's a cliffhanger," right? And I, uh, I'm, I can't remember the timeline, right? That we we knew that there was when the news the when the I shouldn't call it news when the rumor broke on that popular internet website that IDW would no longer have the license and a different publisher would. Did we? How immediately did we know that a different publisher would continue the story? Oh, I think it was quite some time afterwards. It was only okay. for sh- for sure, like, like I want to say about two months ago now, when when he when Har- Larry appeared at uh, FarleyCon, right? That um, so he confirmed that he'd, okay. he was working he said... on three hundred one. Okay, and he he posted on his Facebook something to the to the equivalent of saying that yeah, that's it. I'm I'm sort of just about to finish my last issue of G.I. Joe and you know it's, it's gonna be strange not not having it and there was a quote that that was quoted um in uh, by IDW in their PR I think around the this the, the end of the license and, and and Hammer said now however I've come to the end and it truly feels like leaving home leaving characters that have been my friends for four decades many of which in in fact are based on my actual friends and acquaintances and i can feel a real emptiness looming so so that's him pre-knowing that um that the story's continuing and it sounds a little bit more you know of a kind of definitive you know so long so long folks so so yeah i guess and and even even if there's a speculation that there's a new publisher and and not knowing whether they're going to pick it up for sure or not until there's ink on the contract um, I'm sure Larry is skeptical enough to to know that it's not a, a sure thing. Right. Okay. So the other sort of surprise, did you think Snake Eyes was coming back or how did you feel now that Snake Eyes has come back? It, it, I mean, it's, it's strange, isn't it? Cause the, all of the indications from the story were kind of pointing that way in, in some form. So we were kind of expecting something to mean that by issue 300, there was likely to be some sort of return of of snake eyes but but with a bit of doubt in my mind given what larry had said in the letter columns about that he he was dead and 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 maybe the no prize to his letter columns <laughs> which which seems appropriate is that maybe the original snake eyes that died at the hands of a grenade and and, and serpentor back in 213 or so wherever it was Maybe he he is you know done that that version of Snake Eyes is is dead and won't return, um and and this is a is a new Snake Eyes because I guess the unwritten unwritten law of comics is that if somebody dies off panel 
they are 100% for sure not not dead. So there's, I think, because of the way that Death of Snake Eyes was treated, it, it felt a little bit like we were cheated in, in terms of having a definitive death where we know for sure that he has died. Seeing the body. Exactly. It isn't just going to be... As opposed to, say, Serpentor in the original Cobra Civil War. Exactly. So that guy's definitely dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, or Cobra Commander in, in the original Marvel run, taking a bullet point blank. Um, so, it, you know, he sort of disappears off off panel and we just have to take it on faith that he's he's dead and not coming back when everything we know as a comics reader would indicate that, that he's not, you know, if we've not seen the body, we've not seen the, the death on panel. So maybe, you know, that is the end of that Snake Eyes. He's he's dead and not coming back and we've got a new version of the, the Snake Eyes. If he does come back, then, of course, there'd be four Snake Eyes running about, which would be even more confusing. But uh, the new Snake Eyes we've got is, is you know, it's not per se exactly the same as the old Snake Eyes because, you know, he's had a sort of memory restore point from from the brainwave scanner, from whatever point that his memories were taken from. You know, that's not 100% clear what, uh, you know, wh- where he will remember up to. There's been a lot of time intervening years since since then that he's missed out on. So, uh, so yeah, there, there's some interesting fertile ground to to cover there. He, he, of course, he speaks in this issue. He says the same line of dialogue that we've only ever seen him once say before, which was Scarlet in a kind of slightly croaky, raggedy way, which was when um, he thought that she had you know, it was in a coma and had died. So it's kind of repeat of of that, you know. Maybe he's doesn't have the facial scarring and stuff that that he had before. But I'm not 100 percent sure what the old Snake Eyes had at the point of his death either, because of course he's been through a few different um, phases of of being scarred and, and unscarred. Um, so I I think that tiny question is is uh, I think we know the answer to that. That if Hama in a story before issue 213, before Snake Eyes died needed him to be scarred because he takes this mask off and scares someone or needs to get treatment, he would be scarred. And if some were in there, because there have been a few back and forths, his face is pretty much fixed up. Because, you know, Kama has said, this whole thing is an ongoing retcon. Like, and and I think, I think even though comics people know that term, I think sometimes we sort of forget what he means. Because that's, that's the other way of him saying, making it up as he goes along. So it's like, Anything that I need to decide later on had a significance that you saw before, I'll just write around it and invent a retroactive significance or explanation for it. You know, like, uh, like isn't Chuckles in uh, G.I. Joe Declassified for a page? Uh, the, oh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So th- that's that's Devil's Do, but Hama counts it as his own continuity. He counts it as part of the Marvel IDW Real American Hero Larry Hama continuity. And of course, Chuckles isn't part of G.I. Joe in 1981, 1982. But it makes sense that he'd be around. It's not like he hadn't been born yet. We, the fans, just hadn't met him yet. And so Hama puts him in a scene when the Joe team is having its first mission or is forming. And it's like, yep, I'm retroactively saying that Chuckles was around, and and that's a small one. Okay, so back to back to Snake Eyes. Two questions. One, maybe maybe the first one is a statement. All right, so Snake Eyes is back. I was very surprised. It is the quote original Snake Eyes. It's a clone of the original Snake Eyes. And so the question for me now is, what does Hama do with Throwdown and with Don Marino, and what does Hama do with Snake Eyes? Because is this character somehow upset or damaged or incomplete? Because, you know, all we've got to go on it that he really is Snake Eyes is Dr. Mindbender saying so twice. Yeah, I noticed that too. There's Dr. Mindbender says it. He says he has no reason to doubt that he is the original Snake Eyes. And then Scarlet says something similar. Uh, she says Mindbender bought the real Snake Eyes back. Um, so there's a couple of bits of emphasis that he is the original uh, Snake Eyes, and and there's also a parallel there to to Mindbender coming back as well. We forget that Mindbender died, and this Mindbender we have now is a is a clone, and that was a very kind of quick turnaround of bringing him him back, uh, and and sort of 
really to all intents and purposes is treated as the original mind bender so so there's a there is a kind of precedent to bringing a character back and almost almost saying yep yeah, you know they're the same yeah i think if I, I think if we were to quiz hama right now because mind bender clone i might i think he might say huh let me think about that whereas you <laughs> and i would say forgot. yes yeah. he definitely died on the sunken freighter he definitely was cloned because he had a new action figure in what 93 or 94 and he, and hama had to bring him back and we we talked about uh we talked about you know the new publisher wanting to have somewhat of a fresh start and not just continuing as a 301 you know exactly the same story and what could what could they do to put that in place and and we'd been speculating that that things would be tied up more neatly in a in a bow that, that perhaps they would try and you know get rid of re- resolve the the revanche storyline and to some degree maybe maybe there's a kind of a soft resolution to that that if they've extracted them all and taken to the base and they're sort of no longer connected to cobra gives a bit more wriggle room to to not to not refer to them at least for a little while and and maybe you know snake eyes coming back here uh you know means that when we get to 301 301 there is snake eyes it is the original snake eyes and and it's slightly closer to that original status quo but of course there's going to be a giant you know elephant in the room that he has come back from the dead and and that kind of does need to be addressed in not some small way so so it will have to be a a a focus of the new book really so i think the new book might spend you know half a page once or twice where you know scarlet and stalker maybe lifeline you know, and, and stretcher, right. Not doc, um, (laughs) are saying like, Oh, he's had a tough time, you know, like, Oh, he's just gotten back as if it's sort of like a mission that he went on as opposed to death and cloning. My question for sort of, my question is, is it going to be a big part of the new series or is it going to be a small part? Because, you know, Mindbender wanted an an army of evil snake eyes. And I don't think Hama is going to pick that up in 301, but he could, you know, like this snake eyes might in the middle of 303 suddenly have a, like a scene like Gollum in, I can't remember if it's a fellowship or two towers. It's fellowship, right? Fellowship of the ring where he, you know, the camera cuts back and forth and his good side and his evil side talk to each other as if they're two characters. And this, this snake eyes in 300 could, uh, turn out to be sort of a cobra sleeper or just not ready to go back to active combat duty or uh just want to retire and and maybe scarlet goes with him and (laughs) repeat after me hama makes it up as it goes along i don't think hama knows right (laughs) i think all he knows about what's in 301 is what he wrote in 301 and what all he knows about 201 is what he wrote about 201 and i think he's working on 203 right now and i don't think he knows what's in 204 now and yeah, this sort of Snake Eyes as being a brainwashed by Mindbender to be loyal to Cobra, that could be, you know, fertile ground. It, I mean, it's not the first time that Snake Eyes has been brainwashed to be on Cobra's side. It happened earlier on in the IDW run, if you'll remember that. It also happened in your book three. Yeah. And it's and it's not the first time that um, Mindbender has tried to you know brainwash someone to be a sleeper agent for for Cobra from the Joes as well. I think it's happened for uh, Rock and Roll and Clutch twice, once in yeah. Marvel, once in IDW, and, and that didn't last very long. They quickly snapped out of it. So um, you know Snake Eyes was brainwashed enough that he gave a Cobra salute on you know on command, but but then with a subtle look at uh, Scarlet's. Uh, throwing star was was looked seemed to have been broken out of it or at least sent into a bit of a a rage so yeah there could be something there or it there could be absolutely nothing i think it's also worth and i don't know that we'll never know this question how much effect the editor has so you know the marvel run uh you know denny o'neill was an editor bob harris was an editor bobby chase was an editor mike rockowitz right wasn't it was that was Mike Rockowitz was the editor at the end. And IDW has had, you know, Carlos Guzman, uh, Andy Schmidt, um, some other people, Tom Waltz, and they all, to a greater and lesser extent, 
have an effect on the book. And certainly, I think we all get the sense that the editors edit with a light touch because Hama knows this stuff so well and doesn't need a lot of like, this scene doesn't make sense, write it again. You know, like you, you it's like, you know, you get some person who's only written movies or novels to write one of the nine monthly X-Men comics a year before a crossover, and you're going to have some coaching to do there. And the editors, I think, over over time have been able to rely on not just Hama knowing how to write a G.I. Joe comic, but Hama also was an editor, right? Mm-hmm. And not to say that he can edit himself or he should or he's... He he doesn't need an editor, but you know he was already he was he was already an editor when he was writing GI Joe. So a question that I have is, what influence? Sort of you know what what kind? How much of a positive influence? How much like thumb on the scale? How much um, like positive pressure is the new editor uh, exerting on Hama, or is it sort of like what we think Tom Waltz is, which is you know, Tom Walt sort of lets Hama do what he wants, but might make might make some suggestions like, oh, how about a five part story with this title? Or, hey, you want to introduce some new characters? Or, hey, how about some flashback stories? And I think from the, the sit rep at the front of the book that we've been seeing over the last few issues, I think that to some degree, the editorial team were thinking that the story might go in a slightly different direction because there's this you know, reference to Cobra and, and G.I. Joe characters being brought back from the, the dead. And... I somewhat think that they they were thinking that yeah this would be a cool opportunity we can bring back Crocmaster and Raptor and you know maybe we bring back Doc and and all these other characters that have been dead with this you know and just have sort of a bit of a fun sort of crazy resurrected clone wars and and possibly that the ambition of that bit you know as as Larry was making it up as he went along it just didn't go in that whole, that whole direction it was just like more focused on a on a singular clone serpent or snake eyes the other ideas maybe fell by the by the wayside and in terms of that sit rep right that paragraph of text on the inside front cover which has shown up for the last five or so issues i have gotten a bit of an impression from the fact that this text is inaccurate and has been repeated several times Mm -hmm. that this is not like no one's driving the bus this is not like the editor's are like so checked out on this that they're, um, you know, washing their hands and dusting their hands and walking away and saying, uh, Hama, finish it. Right. That's, that's not how comics are edited. But between the fact that there have been no letters pages for many months and this somewhat inaccurate text at the beginning has repeated several times, I do get the, the, the sense that the deadlines of getting these final issues out have been extra rough. And and I I wonder, I don't want to be pessimistic about this and I don't want to be mean about it, but I wonder if knowing that your series is ending and that the person who writes it knows how to write it and you've got a limited amount of time, there is a little bit more of editing with a light touch in the final issues. And for example, not fixing this text, which is a little inaccurate and has been repeated several issues in a row. I handed this issue to someone who hasn't read this comic in years and they read it and we talked about it. And I think they may have been a little thrown off by the, this, I mean, they wouldn't know that the text is necessarily inaccurate because maybe the reference to resurrecting Joes and Cobras alike, you know, happened a couple issues ago and this person is just reading 300 I, I do wish that this text had been changed a bit with with this issue and with the previous issue. It's like, okay, guys, we know we know that's not what's happening anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's the as a front, Cobra has been busy behind the scenes, resurrecting dangerous villains and heroes alike, all in the hope of creating the deadliest Cobra army ever. We've had Serpent or Resurrected, who's a villain, and and Mindbender Mindbender did have a plan. Mm-hmm. but it didn't happen but, yeah there's i mean they're they're not resurrecting other people yeah at least not yet all right so let's get into the actual issue 
<laughs> we we were talking about the cliffhanger as well. There was there was one other oh, thing yeah. I wanted to mention about that, which was when um, Larry Hammer was talking to Michael Kelly and about this this cliffhanger and ending ending three hundred on a cliffhanger. And what that might mean um, is that he's quite happy to write himself into a corner, not knowing how it's going to be resolved. And he highlighted uh, issue 26 cliffhanger, where all of the Cobra leadership are left in quicksand. And when it came out, Chris Claremont apparently rushed into his office and said, what, what, you know, you've got Cobra <laughs> command all in, all in quicksand. How are you going to get out of this one? And he, And Larry was like, I don't know. I've not ridden it yet. <laughs> uh, I forget what issue it is. Is it is it like one thirteen or one fifteen where the uh, the uh, the mobile battle bunker is dropped out of a plane and the three Joes in it scream, and then and that's the final page. Like mm-hmm. oh, they're plummeting to their doom because the um, the parachutes have all torn because it's too heavy. And I remember reading that and I think, and I thought, oh no, I have this vehicle and one of these guys, <laughs> not, not that I can't play with them if they die in the comic, but, um, and you know, the next scene in the next issue, it's like, oh, right, right. The backup uh, parachute, yeah. Yeah. The, those parachutes were supposed to tear or they're allowed to tear. We have backup parachutes. That was to slow us down. Like, oh, phew. And actually, Larry, in this very issue, he's kind of written his way out, should he choose to to use this or come up with something entirely different. He said, this is Wild Bill. There may be pockets of hydraulic fluid trapped by air bubbles. If one breaks free, we might be able to get enough traction to pull out. Might. So, yeah, maybe maybe we'll get have an air bubble moving in, in between uh, <laughs> in between um, 300 and 301. Uh, if, if, if any editors uh, at, uh, any, at, at a particular publisher uh, who currently have who are taking over the rights to G.I. Joe Comics, would like to hire me to draw a variant cover of a fuel line with some liquid in it and <laughs> air bubbles. I, I know I can pull that off, even with a tough deadline. I also, when I read that word balloon, I thought, and I went, I went back from the final page, and I thought, okay, is this the way that, that they get out? But then I thought, well, that's not really dramatic. So is there some like ninja who's going to jump onto the wing <laughs> with the, and with the handle of their sword sort of bang on the wing where the hydraulic line would be? I believe they've got a ninja on board, Tim. They've got um, Jinx up there. So um... oh, that's right. That's right. Also, you know, like, you know, you can you can escalate the stakes and you can de-escalate the stakes like a like a fader on a sound mixer, you know, like a, like a slider, like a volume slider, the plane can crash and the Joes are roughed up, but okay. Or one of the Joes has a broken arm and the plane can crash and half the Joes can perish and the plane can crash, but other, the rest of them be okay. And the plane can crash and get torn up and all the Joes get tossed out of it. And the plane crashes into the casino and a bunch of civilians get taken out. You know, <laughs> there, there's a range. Uh, I'm guessing it would be on the, on the lower end of that. If not, just that the plane gets uh, saved. Okay, so let's get into the issue. <laughs> We're, we are in the issue. We are in All the right, issue. So. Um, so the most important thing about the issue is, is of course, what is breakout star of the last two arcs? Jeffrey the Techno Viper getting up <laughs> to this <laughs> issue. Um, very little. Cool. Techno, 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 techno. Jeffrey's here, your techno bike and see how bubbles the color, fixing the thing. I've been taken under one bender's wing, resurrecting the dead, experimenting share, downloading things in a ninja's head. Final issue, hundreds here. Let me hear you, Joe fans cheer. Techno, techno, techno bike by yeah. Uh, we see him on page two, right? He's by the giant zombie bomb, and uh, then he disappears. Oh, he gets away. Uh, the page where one of the Vipers says, he's in full berserker mode, mow him down. We see him in panel three, and then he's pushing with uh, another Viper and a Televiper and Mindbender. He's pushing the mutant uh, zombie bomb out on a, a, a gurney on a table with wheels. And that is the last we see of him. Yes, we don't see him on the third to last page when uh, Serpentor Khan and Mindbender are arguing about using uh, the bomb. 
So he is still in play. So we'll see what he gets up to in uh, in three o one. All right. So part of what part of what um, struck me about this issue was was format that it is an over length issue. That is the term from IDW's catalog solicits. And when issue two fifty came out, two fifty was quote oversized and. I want my final issues, my first issues, my anniversary issues to be double sized, right? I want 48 page, or I guess these days, 40 page comics. And, you know, there's there's a little bit of play there if you have some pinups in the back, if that counts as an extra, as one of your double pages or not. So a normal G.I. Joe issue in the IDW run is 20 pages. This main story is 30 pages. And... A normal G.I. Joe comic is uh, $4. This comic is $7. And when IDW did extra pages for issue 250, the math worked out. $4 for a regular issue. That issue was $5. It was four extra pages. And uh, that math worked out. That ratio is the same. You're paying an additional 25% for an, an additional 25%. And I got very excited that with this almost double cover price on this issue that this issue would be almost double length and i am happy with a 30 page main story uh from a 20 page main story well the the story the story isn't quite double length it's 10 pages more but the the actual number of pages pretty much is yes so then we get so this is an interesting first for a a a gi joe comic from in in this idw run where Instead of where the letters page would normally fall or an ad for the next issue or some other IDW book, we get the B cover, the C and D cover, uh, the F cover, uh, the G cover, the H cover. I'm getting these letters wrong. But (laughs) we get, except for the um, online exclusive and and the Nerf exclusive, we get all of the other, other covers. And that's fun. And uh, Transformers books have been doing this at IDW now for two years. And Ninja Turtles books have been doing this at IDW now for, I think, two years. And that's fun because if you don't have a lot of money and you only buy one cover or your store only gets one cover, then right after the story, you tend to see the cover for the next issue. And then you get like the other two covers for the issue that you're holding, like pinups. And that's really fun. And I like that. And I think you should have that because I think as a monthly monthly reader, you should be rewarded with seeing all of the covers because if you were to buy the trade which is generally cheaper than buying the singles you would get all of the covers in the back so i think it's only fair reward the monthly readers give them give them the pinups in the back of the variant covers but in this case this has not been the the sort of running uh standard for real american hero and i can't help but feel that these five one, two, three, four, five, six, seven extra pages of covers. I'm a, I'm a big G.I. Joe fan, so I am buying the other covers, and I have a store, so I want to. Uh, and we don't, we don't do a lot of variant covers at all at my store. G.I. Joe is almost the exception, because I am a G.I. Joe fan. But I couldn't help but feel like, oh, well, here are seven pages where I could have had some new content, like seven more pages of comics, or some pinups or it's issue 200 right that has an interview with hama and then an Mm -hmm. interview with with shannon gallant yep those were cool and it's been another 100 issues and i'd like to check in with these people it's not a ripoff it's not a disappointment it's it's fun for everyone else who doesn't get all these other covers uh but i did feel like well i sort of feel like the covers all these variant covers are paying for themselves because you're printing more copies because stores are ordering more copies because ostensibly customers want more copies. So no, no, don't double up here. The covers are already out there as covers. Um, and then I turn the page and there's this very fun, very strange four page PSA, which I guess now that I've introduced it, I think we have to talk about it. So the American College of Surgeons and Hasbro present G.I. Joe in Stop the Bleed. Uh, as a comics person, if I'm reading a comic book and you say the bleed, I'm thinking of the space de- between dimensions that Warren <laughs> Ellis introduced, that Warren Ellis introduced in the authority 
and that Mark Millar continued to use in the authority at Wildstorm and now is part of the DC universe, uh, although I don't think they use it very well. So I was, I was a little thrown off. Okay, so here's where I was a little uh, confused by this PSA. The PSAs, the public service announcements from the G.I. Joe animated series from the 80s, over years, over the years, gained a reputation for being silly. Mm-hmm. And in the early 2000s, someone made some finger quotes, funny parody G.I. Joe PSAs, which were like early popular like internet videos. And Hasbro and G.I. Joe and G.I. Joe animation and comics and toys have not gone back to the PSA well very much. The last time they did, sort of officially and on their own, was this past summer with the four issues of the uh, Saturday Morning Adventures miniseries. And Eric Burnham, who wrote that miniseries, wrote this three-page story in Eight. issue 300. And those four PSAs that were in issues one through four of Saturday Morning Adventures were both played straight as like sort of normal PSAs to teach kids some lessons, but also a little tongue-in-cheek. And this PSA in issue 300 is not played tongue-in-cheek. Okay, the previous time that Hasbro officially went to the PSA well was, I don't know, around 2007, 2010, when they were doing the the comic packs with figures. Uh, I can't remember if it was the three packs or the two packs, right? But right, right. Um, And there were uh, two or three of them, like a one-page comic, and it was the back covers, I think, of those G.I. Joe reprints. And... And it sort of ends with like, oh, now I can get these like G.I. Joe figures. It's like I can go to my local store and get this comic and figure two pack. And so, again, that's Hasbro like officially doing the PSA as a format, but having some fun with it. And this isn't to say that Hasbro can't go back to the PSA and have a Joe teach an authentic lesson. But I feel like the audience is only primed for these to be ironic or funny or mean. And so this one is actually serious. And I kept like laughing as I was reading it, waiting for the joke. <laughs> right? I mean, there, and... there is there is some humor there as well, Tim. I think it's it's unfair to characterize it. it's completely straight. You know, when who is it that slices his hand? Is it short fuse? Short fuse. Who we've not seen for for a little while, you know, as he's cut, cutting uh, his sandwich, you know, his reaction, "Ow! Oh man, the knife slipped. I can see the bone." It sort of comes across a little bit like OTT, a bit, uh, you know, a bit kind of Rick and Morty, I don't know. And then on the third page, Roblox is doing his rhyming shtick and the the doctor is, do you always talk in rhyme? Only most of the time. So, you know, there's, I think there's, there's a little bit of fun in there as well. Yeah. Uh, confused is too, is too strong, but this is on top of, me finishing this big Hama story in this comic that like belongs to Hama, right? And they sort of never mix other writers on yeah. the Hama book, right? There are a couple exceptions. Uh, the 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 yearbook from a couple years ago, which had um, Don Marino on one cover or Duke yeah. uh, on another, right? That had a backup story. It was like not Hama. And that was sort of in the animated continuity. And... Um, the uh, the uh, Michel Fife uh, miniseries, uh, Sierra, Muer- Sierra Muerte, was sort of in the Hama continuity and then had those backup text pieces that were like analyzing the Hama continuity, but Hama wasn't in on that series. And then Hama did the uh, Silent Option miniseries and that had backup stories True. written written by someone else. But generally you sort of like don't, you sort of don't mix. And an interesting bit about that is that I noticed that a key character in this little three pager is Dr. Claire Hauser, so Duke mm. Duke's wife, who who was introduced a while back ago in in Hammer's uh, Ara universe, and we haven't seen for probably a good thirty issues or so. Um, and yeah, I was thinking we yeah we've not seen her again. She was a strong character. We would have been good to have her back, and here she is, but um, being written by. Uh, Eric Burnham. So that I found that curious. Yeah, it's not it's not breaking a rule. It's not hurting my feelings. And calling it weird is too strong. But it's it's a little, and even calling it off is too strong. But it it's a little. It's different. It's like, huh? I, I think it's weird. That's that's the word. 
Um, okay, so I've just read these 30 pages. And I appreciate seeing uh, Dr. Hauser. I thought that was cool. And the moment she says who she is, I thought, cool. And then I moved my eyes down and I said, wait, this isn't Hama. Weird. Okay, so, uh, and this isn't to say that other writers can't use this character. Okay, so I've just read this 30-page comic. And then I get seven pages of covers. And I'm like, cool. Also, like, oh, I wanted some more story or some pinups or some interviews. And then I turn the page and I get this four page PSA, which I feel is strange and it's not in this continuity. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know what the calculation of, you know, paying writers and artists and time for schedule, you know, like they said to Hama, you've got 30 pages and then they did their math and they said, okay, we're going to charge this much for the issue. It's this many pages. Oh, we've got some extra pages. What can we do? Or Hasbro said, hey, we just made a deal with the American College of Surgeons, and we very much want this to show up now, right? I don't know what happened. That would be my bet. I, I bet you that there was a conference, uh, a Hasbro bigwig uh, met someone from the Royal College of Surgeons. They've, they said, we've got this thing called Stop the Bleed. It would be really good if we could do something together somehow. And the Hasbro bigwig went, huh? We've got that G.I. Joe brand and they used to do those PSAs and they've got those comics, haven't they? It would be you know, a cool thing if we were, were to do something with you or we think your campaign, Stop the Bleed is great. Let's, let's, let's put something in the, in the comic. I'll get, on the, I'll get on the blower and make something happen. So I am all for anything that gets G.I. Joe in front of people, you know, tie-ins with Nerf, PSAs for the American College of Surgeons. But it does feel strange to me that this happened in issue 300, which is, I thought, like IDW's, you know, swan song and a big chance for Hama to tell a bunch of story, even if he's not going to wrap everything up. And I might be bringing my own baggage. It's like, I need 300 to be the bestest issue ever, whether or not it's the final issue, because it's the final issue for now. And I'm sad, right? I don't, like, if, if me bringing my, my, my expectations is coloring this too much. And I like this comic. It's it's fun. But we've never had a PSA in a G.I. Joe comic. Marvel, Dark Horse, IDW. We've never had an official one, right? I don't mean the sort of jokey one that was in Saturday Morning Adventures. And I loved those, by the way. And, you know, th this is these are two these are two good people, the guy who wrote those and colored those to write this one and color those. And Billy Penn, I'm so glad he got to come back for one more time for G.I. Joe, right? You know, because he did that issue. I really like that issue. And we all sort of wondered, we all, uh, you and me wondered if people from the last year or so might get to come back one more time, do three fill-in pages, do a half a fill-in issue, do a cover, do a variant cover. Cool, Billy Penn gets to come back. That's awesome. But these four page, these three pages of comics, and then the one page of uh, sort of diagram stuff, it's it's sort of like you know you're you're on a trip, you know, and the last night of your trip, you're gonna have a big meal, and someone says, uh, and now for dessert, cabbage. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, well, uh, yeah, I like. It's like no, we've we've prepared it with uh, some extra virgin olive oil and salt and pepper. Like, oh, I, I like cabbage. <laughs> That's not how I expected to end Larry Hama's issue 300 of G.I. Joe. With cabbage. Right? And then I turn the page. Sorry, and Billy, thinking, you're, you're not cabbage. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Eric Burnham, uh, Billy Penn, and Luis Antonio Delgado did a, did a great job on this. I do, like, I do like the art in the story. And an interesting technique as well from, from Billy here, sort of clearly creating the the foreground characters and the uh in the background in slightly different layers sort of really kind of making that sort of animation of style pop yes he in fact uh billy penn uh commented about this on facebook this is from three days ago a quick post regarding thankfulness we're recording this two days after american thanksgiving Back in June, I made the move from being an elementary school art teacher over to middle school. This was a big change that I'm still adjusting to. I was sad that I wouldn't get to contribute to G.I. Joe anymore with IDW losing the license by the end of the year. Then, at the end of the first day of school, I got an invite for a PSA at the end of issue 300. 
The goal was to illustrate three pages in the style of the 80s cartoon. With a tight deadline, I tried really hard to paint the backgrounds with watercolors and colored pencils. Joe deserves it for his 40th anniversary. Uh, Eagle-eyed readers might even notice that the Joes are meeting in the Deer Lake Auditorium. And now you know. And there's a great photo of him holding the comic, making, making a surprised happy face. So I like the PSA. That it shows up here is so unexpected as to be odd, but I still like it. And then there is a letters page. And I was really hoping that editor Tom Waltz would show up to say goodbye and maybe give Hama or one of the other contributors a couple paragraphs to uh, say something. And I'm for closure, I like that Waltz did show up and that he said some nice things. Right, he he's sad to be leaving the book, uh, and now he will be a reader and not someone who helps make it. And he very very indirectly and diplomatically refers to the fact that some other publisher will have it, uh, and that it won't be IDW. Um, and he he names some people who worked on the comic, which is a thing you do in a final issue uh, editorial sign off. There is a person who I wish got mentioned on this page, and that is the editor who. I'm pretty sure came up with the idea for this series to continue the Marvel series. And he was the, I think he was the assistant editor when the book started. And that's uh, Carlos Guzman. Um, And I'm not sure at the moment if he's still an editor at IDW. I I don't think so. But I have been thinking about that person. I'm pretty sure that at a G.I. Joe convention around uh, 2015, Andy Schmidt said to me, oh, it was Carlos Guzman's idea to do this book. Because I think I went up to Andy Schmidt and I said, thanks for continuing Hama's G.I. Joe. That's so cool. And, you know, like Hama gets a lot of credit. You know, the three editors on this book or the the two editors and the um, continuity cop, uh, you know, research specialist to Diana Davis get a lot of credit. Um, But let's not forget the person who who had the idea. Hmm. I, I spotted a couple of things on on the, this letters page, and one one of them was the words from uh, from Tom Waltz, where he says, "I've grown to love the monthly adventures." And I thought, yeah, it's sort of a little bit telling. It, it's I think we've all guessed a little bit that maybe this wasn't necessarily his his dream his dream gig that uh that um it's something that he's sort of yeah has grown on him let's say rather than uh day one being the gi joe expert that i guess a lot of fans would have liked him to have have been in terms of being able to pick up some of the things that that weren't quite right in in some of the issues before uh diana uh, davis joined if if that sentence ends up being telling i do uh, I was happy when Walt showed up because I really like the work he did on IDW's Ninja Turtles. And just because you're a good writer, sort of co-plotter for one licensed book with a big cast doesn't necessarily mean you're the right person for another. But it does mean you sort of know what you're getting into. Anything else to say about the letters page before we dive back into the issue? The other thing I noticed was that he gave credit to Neil Utake and his partner in crime, Amari Osario, who make what they do look easy month after month. And Neil Utake is the credited letterer. But um, as, as far as I can recall, this is the first time I've seen this this other name, Amari Osario. Yeah. So I went to the masthead, which is the IDW sort of staff credits, which is on the bottom of issue... Uh, on the bottom of the inside front cover. And Neil Yotake has always, has for a long time been not just the letterer of this book, but art director, design and production. Uh, excuse me, senior art director, right? The, sorry, the senior is not his name. He's not Neil Yotake, the, the senior. <laughs> He's Neil Yotake, comma, the senior art director of design and production at IDW. Um, and so I think this other person who's getting credit is is in that department, but isn't on the masthead. You know, the way that, um, you know, most many colorists in comics subcontract out flatting the colors to someone else who doesn't get credit and who gets a little bit of the, the payment. You know, like I need yeah. someone else to 
apply just one color for every field, like hair, jacket, gun, sky, and I'm going to go in and change the colors and then, you know, do the gradients or do the light sourcing. Okay, so uh, things I liked about this issue or things where this issue uh, reminded me of other things and things that I didn't like about this issue. On pages two and uh, three, um, twice we get a POV shot from Snake Eyes looking out of his visor. And it's pretty subtle because the shape of the visor is pretty similar to the shape of the panel. But it, it's like a mat, huh. M-A-T-T-E. This is a film term. You know, like in movies when someone looks through a keyhole or binoculars yeah. and you, you see what they see and there's like black all around the screen except for the shape of binoculars. That's cool. I don't know if that's in Hama's plot uh, or if Gallant added it on his own, but that's that's good storytelling. On page three, Mindbender uses the Cobra salute as if we all know what this is and have seen it before. And I'm sure it's shown up a few times in the last hundred issues, but the only Cobra salute that I really remember is from issue one, which is a uh, a similar but not quite the same uh, salute. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm saying, oh, cool, Mindbender has a device to sort of test uh, Snake Eyes' loyalty. And, you know, Hama might be retroactively adding this to continuity. Oh, yeah, there's always been this Cobra salute. You've never, <laughs> you've just never seen it. Like, And he's allowed to do that because that's how he writes and he keeps telling us that. And I think sometimes we don't, I think sometimes we don't believe him. Um, so uh, page five where uh, Snake Eyes takes out these two Vipers with the sword and then catches their AK-47s. Mm -hmm. Reminds me a little bit of the page in Silent Interlude in issue 21, where he takes out the two Cobra soldiers. And also reminds me a little bit of um, G.I. Joe Origins 19, which is the a wordless issue, a, a quote silent issue drawn by Joe Benitez, which is, I, th pr I think Hama probably technically considers it part of his continuity, but it was published as one of the other IDW uh, comics so sort of not in the like marvel idw continuity but in that in that story um hama kept very careful track in the writing of it of snake eyes's weapons like his clips and his um sword and or his knife as he sort of goes on the mission and in the plotting really wanted the artist to keep track of it it's like he doesn't have this anymore he has this one clip he catches this clip um uh okay so page six is a uh, is a splash page. And um, I've said before that I, I don't love it when uh, color artists in comics use photographs of sky or water in the place of sky or water. I think they should use a color or many colors. I think they should, you know, paint because that's that's what Photoshop is. It's, it's painting. It's applying color. And if it's, you know, if it's solid colors with hard edges, you know, like like animation or anime color styling, that's also fine. But when I look at this photograph of water that's very much floating under the, all of these uh, islands, I don't see like comic book water in this scene. I see a photograph of water because the water in the photograph is photographed from like, like standing on the beach, like I'm five feet tall. Or maybe I'm like standing on a lifeguard's chair and I'm like 10 feet tall. But we are definitely like a hundred or a thousand feet up, looking down at the water, and so it's subtle. But the perspective of this water doesn't match the drawing, doesn't match the camera angle. I spy on this page, Pixar esque Toy Story clouds. By the way, <laughs> oh, are, are we in Andy's room? Uh, yeah, Andy's wallpaper. Uh, not, it's not quite. It's not quite. They, but it's you close. know, the, the, you know, these look like Mark Bright clouds to me. And yeah. whether it's GI Joe or those Iron Man covers from like '85, I love Mark Bright clouds. Uh, I draw. Uh, I try to draw my clouds like those. And this is this is a splash page, which I think is about one of seven or so in the issue. There are six. So, there are uh -huh. six in the issue pages. Uh, pages uh, 7, 12, 14, 19, 23, and 30. Thoughts on, on so many splash page is? Okay, so uh, I, this is one of my notes. Uh, so I think in an over length or oversized issue, it's okay to use up some of your extra pages with splash pages. Hama doesn't use a lot of splash pages. You mm. know, G.I. Joe comics tend to have four, five, six panels per page. 
uh, this is a special issue. And so to have the occasional sort of punctuation mark or flourish when it's like, no, let's cut back to the plane. Let's set up the plane. The plane is going to be important later on in this comic or a moment of I mean, absolutely Scarlet embracing Snake Eyes. Yes. Give that a splash page. I'm sort of wary in a final issue where I feel like a lot is getting moved forward, if not wrapped up, that too many splash pages might be, quote, I don't want to say wasteful, um, less than economic. But uh, what this reminded me of was, A, that we don't see this many splash pages in an issue, or proportionately this many splash pages in a regular issue. B, this reminded me of 275, which was all splash pages. And this made me think back to previous anniversary issues, 250, 200, 225 wasn't all that special of an anniversary issue, but technically it is 150, 100, and 50. And I didn't pull all those out to count, but I think this is the, except for 275, I think this is the most splash pages we've gotten in an issue of G.I. Joe ever. There, there was an issue where it was like the culmination of the Broker Beach storyline where Snake Eyes teams up with Baroness and there's a against Cobra and Revanche and there's a team of Joes who are uh, on a cruise liner who crash into the pier and that issue has every other page as a splash page. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, so, so that's that's uh, the that's the other sort of big exception, but that was kind of a, a stylistic choice in a similar way to two seventy five. Yes, yes. In those two cases, Hama's doing something like uh, like one twenty five and yeah, like one twenty six. An yeah, trip triptych and diptych and and silent interlude. Right. Like, let me make this interesting for myself. Let me give myself a challenge. Let me give my artist a challenge. All right. So uh, I think you alluded to this in your plot breakdown, but. In the previous issue, I thought we were worried that Wade might die. Yeah, this is he... one of my this is one of my notes. Um, Previously on Talking Joe. Hi, I'm Tim Finn, and uh, Wade Collins <laughs> will definitely be dying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here here's here's my here's my comment on this. Wade seems fine. If no one's going to refer to the fact that the injury wasn't as bad as they thought it was, or his patch, you know, like, oh, we've patched you up, the tourniquet or whatever it is, the bandage, like, I got the bullet out, whatever it is. All I need is one sentence of dialogue to allude to the fact that it's it's gotten better. Like, okay, I think we can make it to the tree line after all. Or can you walk? I think so, yes. Or, hey, I took the bullet out, right? But since no one refers to it, it feels like an omission as opposed to, oh, like, just say that it's okay. Because in the previous issue, it seemed like he was sort of saying goodbye to his kid mm. and us. Yeah, it seemed a lot more final and a lot more serious last last issue. But it's they, they've they not forgotten about it. And, and in small ways, it is referenced. So, so where Wade is shown, he is typically holding on to his side, holding his wound. Okay. And he is typically sat or or laid down because he is in a bad way. That's true. He's not he's not running around with Storm Shadow's sword taking out vipers. Storm Shadow is. There's the page just after the hiss has been blown up by the whale, and the team is reunited where they're sort of cheering. Um, Storm Shadow says, "Way to go, Cutter!" And you can see there, Wade is is on the ground. He's resting against a rock. Um, he's celebrate. You know, he's well enough to celebrate and have a little cheer, but he is still holding on to his side and when he is when he is transported onto the way or he is helped up by the rest of the the team there he's not in a in a good enough way to actually climb up himself onto the whale and he is propped up against the the front and there's a teeny tiny little moment where sean is reunited with him and and sort of you know they're holding hands and, and clearly sean is is glad to see his uh his dad again yeah, uh, th- good point. Maybe I was relying too much on the dialogue and not enough of the story that gets told uh, in the pictures. Because indeed, every time we see him, he's he's seated, he's holding his injury, even if we don't see it. And when he's loaded onto the onto the uh, the whale, let me jump back to this splash page, this first splash page with the C one hundred and thirty again. I forgot to mention that it does something really helpful which is it shows us the whole island, mm. where the cruise ships are, where the hotel is, 
and the smoke from the previous battle where the there was the incursion on the airstrip. Yes, yes. And so I bet you that Hama's plot for this page calls out all three of those things and that Hama said to himself, I need to reestablish for the reader where everything is in relation to each other. All right. So I wondered if page 17, I wondered, is this the final appearance of Alpha 001 in the Blue Ninjas? I wonder, going back to my comment on um, how involved will a new editor at a new publisher be? I wonder if a new editor might be saying, hey, here is a set of characters or circumstances which you can not focus on because maybe this new editor has been paying attention to this run and finds that, you know, that that plot line hasn't added enough or knows that some readers don't love it. Or or maybe you know, the Blue Ninjas are going to be in half of issue 301 and I'm just wrong here. But, <laughs> you know, you, you see five issues ago how there are these three factions you know, heading towards something on Cobra Island. I guess four, if you count the civilians who were already gambling, right? Civilians, Cobras, Joe, Blue Ninjas. And I think the explanation here to have the Blue Ninja storyline exit stage left works, you know, sort of done with a light touch. I thought it was a an interesting and proper editorial, I mean that in a general sense, sort of writing and decision-making decision to not show Snake Eyes' face, that we're not sure if if it's injured or not. But A, it sort of doesn't matter. Like that, that actually is not part of the story. The story is that he's back and Scarlet is relieved and that he's having some kind of a hard time in, in the, the shape of his uh, word balloon for that one word. And sort of smartly in story and in, in art, right? He takes his mask off, we see him from behind. She says, shh, don't say another word. We see him from behind. She hugs him. She's in the way. And, and prior to that, in Scarlet's dialogue, she says, snake eyes, your face. Right. And we we don't know what that means. What does that mean? Right. And maybe Hama does and maybe he doesn't. And on the uh, and then the page after they hug, right, where we're looking at the Joes, we're, we're sort of higher than the Joes on the whale and the whale's coming at us and Storm Shadow's jumping uh, and she and Snake Eyes are standing and holding each other, and her hair is in front of his face. Uh, like the movie poster for Get Smart. Okay. Um, <laughs> good callback, Tim. So we've not we've not talked massively about the art here, other than sort of calling out that it's it's great to have Shannon back on this final issue and alluding to to it being possibly being slightly more rushed than he would have liked on on some of the boards you know the ones uh they um they were uh, quite quite tough on the art on on this one and um and shannon more generally personally I, th- I think while while it's maybe not the flashy modern marvel art i think the storytelling as we've always talked about is absolutely great there's never any doubt as to following what's happening what's where the the decisions in the art and not always necessarily the you know easy shortcuts uh, you know there's interesting things happening with the foliage the expressions the body language the little things happening in the background getting all of the vehicles weaponry etc you know just right um some some of the detailing is is slightly more pared back you can kind of see it in like the details of some some of the weaponry like those AK47s there's you know there's there's some lifting being done there by the coloring and and stuff a speculation which i somewhat agree with is like with a bit more time with maybe a different inca the the likes of you know um rod wiggum's art being lifted by uh, andy mashinsky's inks back in the day how that might look and just give it a little bit more of a sheen if the sort of minimum standard for inker is to uh make the pencils ready for reproduction right uh, nowadays, you could do that by taking a scan of the pencils and in, in Photoshop, in levels or curves, darkening them. And then you realize that some of the lines need to be thicker for clarity. And then you realize that some places where the artist wants something to be solid black, you'd need to 
paint in the solid black because maybe they've only indicated it with a, a symbol. You know, they like put an X, make this make, make this shadow over here uh, solid black. And I was thinking about there. There are many pencilers nowadays in comics who pencil so tightly that you don't need inkers the way that you used to. Right? You used to need inkers in the 30s through the 90s because comic art wasn't scanned. It was photographed with a camera, with a film camera. And the film was high contrast. It could only pick up whites and blacks. If you wanted to do gray, like, like a gradient, you had to do a halftone, like those dots or those, those lines. Or you needed to manually ink some kind of halftone, like hatching and crosshatching, right? Uh, or, or feathering, uh, a brush technique. So inkers not only served a mechanical purpose, but that, you know, and also it was about splitting up the, uh, the, the assembly line of comics so that people could make comics faster because two people can pencil and ink faster than one person in almost all cases can pencil and ink. So the first time that I noticed that a comic could be printed without uh, an inker was in the summer of, I forget, 94, 96. It was one of the two years that um, Marvel and DC did the uh, Amalgam event where they had these like mashups of Marvel and DC characters. And uh, Marvel took Thor and from Marvel and Orion from DC and mashed them up. So the character is Thorion, right? And they took the Asgardians and the New Gods. So the comic is Thorion of the New Asgods. And John Romita Jr., penciled that comic and it was not inked and i think because whatever it was 95 you know the 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 studio coloring it and i don't remember who it was like they could take a scan of the pencils and darken them or ramita jr or the editor could like photocopy the pencils and darken them on a photocopier and make it work and there is an issue of uh crisis on infinite earths in 1986 that george perez penciled so tightly and carefully it was not inked and that that series had three or four different inkers right Okay, so sorry, let me come back to G.I. Joe. I have seen there there are pencilers nowadays in comics who pencil so tightly and carefully that they don't really need inkers. Most pencilers do benefit from an inker if the inker is good. And I think if Shannon Gallant is penciling really fast and stuff is a little loose, sure, yes. He he benefits from an inker to just clean up a line. And if he's like sketched in two lines that are close to each other, the inker like chooses one or draws between the two, right? This is the line. What I have decided about Maria Keene's inking is that, and this is with the this is with the the recognition that this is all this, the deadlines for this final year is just rough, right? Like this is a hard book to draw, and these deadlines are really rough. What I see in Maria Keene's inking is like a minimum amount of clarity. Like this object is different from this object. This person's in front of this uh, wall, right? This person's holding this gun. This person's wearing clothing. Clothing's different from from uh, flesh or hair. But I don't see anything in the ink I don't see anything in the inking that shows me that. And and here's a comparison, right? I look at the first panel of page 2 of issue 300 and there there are some spotting of blacks, right? There's like little chunks of black sort of under the gurney and the shadow uh, of the top layer of the gurney and in Serpentor Khan's cape, but also his hair is black, so that sort of reads as a whole and um, there's black behind snake eyes where the tank gets broken. Everything, all of the lines in this panel, they're all treated the same. The, the mechanical quality of the zombie bomb, the billowing cloth of Serpentor's uh, cape, the liquid under snake eyes, and the, the flesh of, you know, Mindbender or let's say Mindbender. I compare that to this is just a this is just a random example, right? But turn to page eleven of issue fifty nine of GI Joe. Sorry, it's page eight. Uh, the bottom page number on the bottom of the page is page eight, which is a Ron Wagner, Bob McCloud page. And on this page, uh, Hawk is talking to Outback, and then three vehicles turn around: the Ostriker, the Havoc, and the uh, uh, mobile personnel carrier. And look at the inking on this page, right? Bob McCloud inks the rocks differently than the dirt, differently than the trees, differently than the vehicles, the, the glass on the Havoc's cockpit, 
and the shadow on the front side of the all striker differently than he inks uh, Outback's hair, right? Inking really is a drawing. And, you know, uh, on this G.I. Joe page from issue 59, the dry brush on the cast shadows under the vehicles and to the left side of the, the, the tree line, right? So McLeod is inking all these things differently. And they look different. They feel different. And so, so Maria Kin's inking in issue 300 of G.I. Joe, it surpasses the basic standard of, of clarity, but there isn't any embellishment. And if she had no time, you know, that, that's a bummer. And I'm glad we, I'm glad we got this issue at all. Um, but I, I do look forward to, uh, with a new G.I. Joe publisher, the art getting pushed a little more. Is this a page that you have that you yes. are? Yes. Right. Yes. That's, that's why I thought of it. I, at it before. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking about your description. I think, I think probably a lot of those details come across a lot better by seeing the page in person than possibly the 1980s comic printed reproduction of the page. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, you know, IDW's reprinting of issue 59 probably doesn't look amazing compared to you know, the, the first 50 issues, which got um, a better treatment. Um, on top of Maria Keene's inking, right, I know I'm hard on Jay Brown's coloring on Real American Hero, but, you know, just, just one example, page uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Just one example, the bottom panel of page eight, the one where Storm Shadow has shown up and he's taking out three alley vipers with swords. This, this panel's really loud and busy. And I don't mean because a ninja is taking out three armored guys and because there's an inset panel. I mean because the colors are loud and they're, they're fighting with each other. So I think Maria Keene's inks would benefit from a much less saturated palette with fewer gradients or no gradients and fewer color changes, you know? Like the sort of yellow mustard green gradient behind Storm Shadow and the three alley vipers. Yes, that does allude to the fact that there's foliage and we're in the we're in the jungle. But that doesn't need to be the color choice. It doesn't need to be that yellow green becoming that brown green olive. And it doesn't need to be a gradient at all. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that because SL Gallant does share some of his art online on his blog page and on, on social media, we're able to sort of compare a little bit against his pencils and the printed version. And as you, as you say, it's, it's kind of, it needs to be made print ready that um, his lines are tight uh, on these, on, on, on this issue and in the, the images that he's shared that it's, it's pretty much all, all there. So there's there's somewhat of looseness to to be cleared cleared up, but the the key thing is that in terms of the spotting of blacks, that is not done. It's all left open, um, you know, with the uh, with X's to indicate where the the blacks need to be inked in. So I think you know, for, in terms of time process, that that it, it's sort of division of labor. I'll I'll do the detail of the drawing, and I need someone else to finish it off and put the blacks where they need to to go is the the key thing happening um here um that that definitely needs to to happen to get it print ready and it you know if it wasn't uh if it wasn't the inca doing that it would need to be a colorist taking just as much time and doing the same thing essentially filling in you know manually looking where those x's are and they where, where it needs to be made into a solid black one thing i noticed diff slightly different about the the inking talking to to maybe it being more quick is that some of the inking choice the more sort of um i guess inventive inking choice choices that we were seeing in some of the early earlier issues like i think 291 where we noticed that there was kind of these zipper tone effects and things we've we've seen less of that uh in in this issue there's something in the art in this issue which is it's not new for gi joe but it's um a little uncommon and that is blood. There's a lot of blood. It's a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of ninjas lot of... slicing and dicing. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw, I'm trying to remember when we last, we we saw some blood in the silent option miniseries. We saw, uh, I think there was a lot of blood in Dawn of the Rashikage between 245 and mm, 250. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, Nitho Diaz drew both those arcs. I think he was drawing a lot of blood. 
And all of this blood in issue 300 is is brown. Whether on purpose or not, that's a reference to the Comics Code Authority rule or Marvel's interpretation of it sort of in the 70s and 80s where the, the Comics Code Authority went into effect in the 50s. It, publishers came up with it so that they could put EC, not DC, out of business and stave off uh, criticism and legislation and uh, book bans and book burnings, right? So they, the publisher said, okay, we'll police ourselves. Comics won't be too ghastly and violent and sexual. Uh, and one of the rules was blood can't be red. And if, if, I'm, if I don't have that fact entirely uh, accurate, then Marvel certainly made up that rule for itself <laughs> in, in its process of being code approved and getting the Comics Code Authority label on its covers. Uh, you don't see a lot of blood in G.I. Joe comics. Yeah, let's, um, let's flick to, I think it's around about page 12, Snake Eyes in the lab. He's in full ber- berserker mode, mow him down. And he's, and there's some great storytelling here with um, my mind bender and Jeffrey ducking out of the, the lab while the troops <laughs> uh, rush in and, and he's defending himself with that alley viper shield and the bullets are bouncing off. And then there's this, uh, this great panel of clone snake eyes with one hand slicing a night creeper. And with the other one, he's decapitating a night viper with the alley viper shield shlunk that's the the heads disappearing and then the next page is a splash page of um of snake eyes of uh in in the lab and in the bottom right hand corner is a as a sort of a viper na- knocked out in purple with a smoking head with a, a great big pole in the back of the the helmet with the smoke smoking out of the back of it and drips of blood coming down from it great stuff yeah, um, we didn't see a lot of blood in the Marvel run. We have seen more blood in the IDW run. I'm always a little surprised when we see it because I, I always think of this comic as sort of being aimed at 7 to 15-year-olds and the lower half of that, 7 and 8 and 9-year-olds. But, you know, it's who this comic is aimed at right now in 2022 is different than who... 47. Wait, what did I say? No, no, it's now aimed at people the oh. ages of approximately 47 <laughs> right right um there there was a while early on in the idw hama run when by the barcode every issue said recommended for readers 13 and up and that disappointed me because i didn't feel like the comic was darker than it had been in the 80s and in the 80s it was advertised on television for kids buying the toys mm. 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 but Yes, if you were to hand me this comic book, IDW 300, is it PG or is it PG-13 if it was a movie? I, I think it's PG-13, but there's also no cursing and no nudity. And, you know, those those three categories, those two plus violence, you know, you sort of do your math, you, you, mix, your, you mix your formula. You know, it's like, okay, I can say the F word once, but um, because I'm so used to the Marvel take on... Uh, gunshots and explosions and swords when there is this much blood in an idw issue i'm always surprised but you know if you if you cut up a a viper like that there would be that much blood so um it's uh it's grounded oh uh, i wanted to point out one more thing okay on page seven this this isn't this isn't a good thing or a bad thing it just is (laughs) Um, but uh it's it's an observation of how of the mechanics of comics when when I read comics, I'm paying attention to how much time or distance takes place between panels or between pages. And I think a lot about uh, Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics. And he comes up with, in that book, six different types of panel-to-panel transitions. He has names for them and examples. And the three panels on the top of this page, right, these are all moment-to-moment Duke says something, and then it's it's a moment later, even though we're somewhere else uh, seeing a televiper, but Duke's dialogue continues. And then in the next panel, it's a moment later, and we're back on the plane, and Scarlet is reacting to uh, Duke. I love her expression, and I love the body language that she's pointing. From the third panel on that page to the fourth panel, Hama and Gallant jump ahead several minutes because Duke says, get your shoots on, 
Wild Bill circle back around. And then in the next panel, Stalker and Scarlet already have their shoots on. They're already in the back of the plane ready to jump out. She's already jumped out. And again, this isn't, I guess this is a good thing, right? I'm not saying this is amazing or innovative, and I'm not saying this is problem or unclear or bad. I'm just saying this is the language of comics, that sometimes you have a break like this on a page turn. You can have breaks like this within a page. But if you are writing your own comics, something to think about is, for example, with this page, like, did we need the one or two beats between these two pa panels where Scarlet and Stalker walk to the back of the plane and then put on their parachutes and then open the door, right? Or do, do we need to see a panel of the plane aiming one way and then turning around in the next panel and now aiming the other way, right? The circle back. And the answer to those questions is no. So you as the writer or you as the artist or you as the writer artist get to choose your pacing, right? To use a film term, how much are you cutting? What are you cutting between shots? You know, like, is it more of a montage? Are you jumping ahead a minute? So when I saw that, I thought, cool, I should mention that on the podcast. Back to you, Mark. <laughs> I spy with my little eye. So I spy a 1987 Cobra jetpack. Very rare appearance for this uh, strange little vehicle. Yes. And this is, I think, Hama creating a problem for himself and then writing himself out of it or thinking of a solution to a problem mm -hmm. while he thinks of the of the problem. Okay, I need I need to take down the C-130. Yep. And before the Cobra jetpack crashes, uh, two or three panels above it, we see some in the air. So, you know, the, the groundwork is laid. Yep. Uh, Pop Quiz, who is on the box art to the 1987 Cobra jetpack? Uh, Mindbender? It is Crystal Ball. Oh, okay. Well, do I get do I get a half a point for like a weird flamboyant <laughs> weird cobra mustache villain chest. who's trying to control you? Yeah. That, it's, I mean, it's... I didn't say I didn't say uh, you know an eel like the cobra <laughs> night landing. I knew it's definitely it's, it's definitely not an eel, right? It's definitely it's not a strato viper. It's not a secto viper. Uh, I I had I had no eye spies. Error detected. Error detected. No prize incoming. I have two. One, it, one which is definitely an error, and one which is is something to explore. My definite error was that on around about page twenty-two, uh, one when they're back in the lab, um, Snake Eyes is by the loading bay. Top right hand corner by the words in the lab, there is a cobra being shot. What character is that being shot, Tim? Uh that is a good question. Well, it sort of looks like that character has a vest like a regular Viper. Um, but they don't have high they don't have knee high boots like a regular Viper. And there seems to be some logo on their helmet, but Vipers do have a thing on their helmet, those goggles. But I put you out your misery, Tim. It actually, in terms of the coloring, it looks a little bit like that character Rip It, I think. Uh, the Cobra Hiss 3 driver, I think that is. But what the character, I'm 99% sure, is meant to be is a miscolored saw viper. Oh. You think about the sort of the slit on the eye there, but the real tell is, and the sort of the vest, that sort of built up kind of black jacket type yeah. thing. Uh, but the real tell is the weapon that he is holding. It is that distinctive saw viper uh, right. gun. With the, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. That's good. Uh, the, the error detected that I was less sure about was earlier on in the issue it's on that on that page where he's getting a bit confused he's seeing scarlet and they say what's he doing with his sword and initially on the what's he doing panel he has got his sword in his hand and with his sword he seems to be putting it 
on his back. And then on the next panel, he's drawing the sword. We should shoot. And I was thinking, why has he got to draw the sword if it's already in his hand? But as I'm saying this, I kind of have realised it myself. Uh, he's got a the sword in the scabbard. It needs to, the the scabbard needs to go on his back so that he can unsheath it and keep the scabbard um, in its proper place on his back. I I also thought about this and and wondered about the sort of one two three of it. Yeah, it when I first looked at it, it made it didn't really make sense, but I think it's 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 still a bit weird, but it sort of clicks. Do you have a, an error detected? I do. I have four. Oh my word. Okay, um, uh, page, the first one may not be an error detected. Uh, page nine, panel three, Mindbender's first word balloon is definitely to Serpentor Khan. Yes, Serpentor Khan, I will deal with it. We have our own problems here in the lab. You will have to make do with, and then I realized, oh, his second word balloon is him talking on the phone to the Viper who just called huh. him. And I feel like this second word balloon either wants to be a whisper or... This this long third panel on the page could have been broken into two panels. Yeah. And Mindbender in the second panel, he sort of turns and has an aside and he says directly into the phone, uh, we have our own problems here. You'll have to make do with what's available to you. And then but but is coming from the phone because I, I don't know if he's so embarrassed or or worried that Serpentor Rex Khan will hear him tell the Viper out on the beach or excuse me in the jungle that he's on his own but i feel like something in the art or the lettering or the storytelling needed to create a bigger difference between mindbender's two word balloons here yeah so not quite an error detected but a uh half of an error detected <laughs> and of course uh, shannon's probably working from a script here that doesn't have the the panel by panel beats with all of the dialogue so that's kind of worked out after after the event so <laughs> you know hard one to lay the blame anyway on this one i think yeah i mean this i think this is one of those cases where the editor reads it when it's all done and hopefully like has the time to like sit on it for a day and and say oh you know what this this sort of mistake inadvertently cropped up between writing and drawing and word balloons what's the easiest fix oh should we turn that word balloon into a whisper like make it gray or have a, a broken line around it, a dotted line around it. It's like, oh, well, we don't have time to draw a new panel or do a patch. Hmm. Okay. Uh, error detected. Turn the page, page 10. Uh, the caption says, on the west shore of Cobra Island. And Cutter refers to the ramp down on the whale. And on the bottom right of the panel, the ramp is sort of sitting on the water. And that's when I realized that Jay Brown put in this photograph of water for the entire background, but you can see that there's some foam under Polly ah, and then yes, sort of to yes, the left yes, of the yes. whale. It's like, no, no, no. The entire right side of this panel shouldn't be water. Like those two rocks on the top right, to the right of them, that should be brown or, or beige. That should be sand or dirt. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, so this, this background, so the error is that this, this background is missing a layer or it's missing like a color, uh, page 11, the next page, th this isn't so much an error as it is, a I would have chosen differently. So there's a night creeper in two of these panels trying to take out snake eyes with a machine gun. And then snake eyes takes out the night creeper and yes, the night creepers can totally use machine guns. But and there isn't room in this issue for a random Cobra contractor ninja to have a ninja face off with Snake Eyes. But in general, when I see Night Creepers, particularly ones with swords in their backpacks, I want to see them use their for swords. Mm. Uh, an, uh, a Toxo Viper is certainly allowed to pick up a gun and not just like shoot toxic gas at someone, right? Or toxic sludge, you know. And a Techno Viper can drop his like giant drill and branch and pick up a, a rifle but night creepers are ninjas first and foremost so anyway and then this is a very small one but on page 25 this is where the uh cocktail waitress uh in the jetpack tries to take down the c-130 in the second panel the word balloon tail that's going to ghost rider in the stealth cockpit 
is actually pointing at the air intake on the stealth. And there's definitely not a pilot mm. there. Okay. Harsh, Tim, but fair. It, it's, it's true. It should have been pointing in the cockpit. <laughs> That's in the details. That is in the details. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the previous panel, the two word balloons do terminate roughly where Wild Bill and Duke yeah, would be yeah, yeah. In, the, in the cockpit, so. It's a Larry Hammer colloquialism. He's talking G.I. Joe and all its heroism. Can you guess what it is? Is it something new? Now listen as Larry drops a slice of real life on you. I had a, a good colloquialism this issue. It was damn the torpedoes. Now, uh, as as a uh, as an American representing all American people and knowledge, is this uh, an exclamation that would be common knowledge to most, Tim? Fifty uh, fifty. Um, I think it's it's a phrase that I have heard, but I've only heard people use it sort of, you know. It's probably a military term from uh, this. This is all conjecture. I feel like I've only heard. I feel like I've only heard people use this sort of in, in an indirect reference back to its original meaning. Uh, I don't I don't know. I don't know what it means. I've always I've always thought I knew what it means. But I actually want to hear you tell me where it comes from. Tim is an exclamation by David Farragut, an officer in the Union Navy in the Civil War in, <laughs> in 1864, warned of mines, which were called torpedoes at the time, in the water ahead. Farragut said, damn the torpedoes, Captain Drayden, go ahead. Due full speed. So uh, it's okay. an ex- it's a exclamation hearkening back to a time in the Civil War where uh, a military leader uh, was basically saying head into the danger yeah right okay um or a reference to the third studio album by tom petty and the heartbreakers okay so i, I just sounded ignorant <laughs> when i when i was making my uneducated uh guesses i'm going to distract you for a moment now and tell you that there's a there's a gobot and oh. his name is dive dive <laughs> And that's a thing that captains of that the command to submerge a tor- uh, to submerge a submarine in the actual navy. When you want to submerge your uh, submarine, you say dive, dive, and it, that's his name. It, it's the GoBot a submarine? Yes, oh, that's good then. Uh, no, he, he actually changes into an eighteen wheeler. <laughs> quote of the week. Quote of the week. Quote of the week. Quote of the week. Quarter of the week, quarter of the week, quarter of the week. In the in a very recent episode of our podcast, we talked about the final Devil's Due issue of G.I. Joe, written by Brandon Jorwa, the end of that first series. And Jorwa writes a line that I take to be a comment on the fact that that had to be the final issue. And I think this one is inadvertent, but I interpret it similarly. Uh, on page 15... Cutter has just taken on two people onto the whale and now two other people onto the whale. And it's Dawn and Cobra Commander, right? So suddenly they have Cobra Commander as a prisoner on the whale. And previously, when the first two people show up, it's, a, it's like, how'd you get here? It's a long story, right? And then two more people show up. And he says, I think we're in for another long story. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yes, Larry Hama, you are writing many more G.I. Joe comics for a long time excellent i had i had two favorite lines the first one is in the in the lab when when they're talking about whether snake eyes has been properly reprogrammed they serpentors he's potentially extremely dangerous vipers keep an eye on him mindbender there's no need for that he's been completely reprogrammed his loyalty to cobra is indisputable just because a tiger purrs you don't let it loose in a nursery (laughs) <laughs> did you program total loyalty to Cobra when you were resurrecting me? Of course I did. Well, that didn't work out very well for Cobra Commander, did it? <laughs> Excellent. 
Great dialogue there. Um, and then there was a similar bit towards the end of uh, the issue where they're talking about actually using this, uh, what, what do they call it? The um, zombie bomb. And, uh, and, my, and, and Serpentor is sort of indicating he's going to use it. Mindbender says, what are you doing? You can't trigger this thing. That's precisely what I'm doing. But, but, think of it as starting out a great new adventure. You're insane. Well, yes. You should have thought about that before you resurrected me. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Hammer, Hammer's ear for dialogue, and particularly with these more bombastic villains, is unsurpassed. Always, always a highlight. I'm very much looking forward to, in a new series, whether it's a scene with Cobra Commander being uh, crafty and obnoxious as prisoner on on the whale, on the killer whale, surrounded by Joes, getting away from Cobra Island, or sort of jumping ahead in a prison cell on a U.S. military base or at Joe headquarters. Hama writes a good Cobra Commander, of course, and I really like Hama's Cobra Commander when he's backed into a corner. Hmm. Because, I mean, let's not forget, sort of this this closes out with Stalker saying it, uh, they've got Cobra Commander captive already. And he says, if we capture or neutralize Serpent or Khan and Dr. Mindbender, we will have gutted the entire Cobra High Command. Let's get down to business. So, uh, yeah, Cobra very much on the ropes. And then this uh, this zombie bomb, mutant zombie bomb, is the uh, the wild card. What on earth is that? You know, what on earth is going to happen with that? We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a message from Mark in the future. Uh, Mark here. Um, I just, I spotted someone making a connection here to the mutant zombie bomb. And that is that the rumour is that the new publisher will be um, Robert Kirkman's imprint, Skybound uh, Image. And we've got uh, here a mutant zombie bomb. Kirkman is the walking dead creator, the zombie guy. Is this Larry potentially making a little cheeky Easter egg reference? Hmm. Okay, that's it from me. Back to Mark in the past. I don't know. (laughs) And if we guessed, we'd probably be wrong. Is this how I finally... did Did I do this reference already in a previous episode? Is this finally how I get my Toxo zombie? I was promised a Toxo zombie because of an action figure in 92 i forget 91 92 93 and the groundwork is laid in that andrew wildman issue is it uh, is it 125 with flint upside down Mm. there's a hand reaching up out of that vat and a toxo viper falls into a vat in that issue or the issue before the issue after and no one at hasbro made hama introduce that character so they could sell that toy that character certainly didn't show up on the cartoon uh though uh, eco the eco warriors get a two-parter and we get a lot of um uh, cesspool uh but uh is this is this is, are they gonna detonate the bomb and at least one of the <laughs> at least one of somewhere there's a toxo viper who's closest <laughs> to it and he becomes a zombie maybe uh should should we give this a score you can break out your yojo cola from um, assembly required. Lift the lid. <laughs> I I haven't gotten it. I haven't gotten it yet. I was gonna meet up with uh, I was gonna meet up with uh, Chris McLeod last weekend, both to be social and also so he could hand off my my bottle that he nicely drove back from Iowa. Okay, for dramatic and, uh, purposes, and... let's pretend. Open it, Tim. All right. Yo uh... yo cola nut. Great soda. It's Yo Joeage Tom. 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 I will give. Mm, I will give this a six. Oof. Um. I will give this a six. Um. It is. It is good. But you know the 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 cover is in the in the back. Uh. The very fun, but feels out of place. Uh. PSA. You know, for this issue. For uh this final issue when I, I would have preferred those pages go to other content that more directly addresses this series and, you know, good art, great art for the, for the available time given to draw it. But 
But you know, it's an over, I, I like double sized issues or over length issues as this is. I'm glad Snake Eyes is back and also uh, a little disappointed or, or worried that it won't sort of like hit the, you know, it's like, I don't want this to be sort of cheap. At the same time, I didn't like his death. So mm. uh, six. Uh, I am going to go in strong. I'm going to go eight and a half. I was wow. uh, really excited to uh, see this issue. The cover is some, you know, something really special, uh, record-breaking cover. All of the characters on the, on the front, uh, you know, so not that is not something we will you know, normally see or expect to see again. The plot it sort of takes us in directions that sort of follow on from the the groundwork that's been laid, but but you know, never what I would have predicted. Uh, so, you know, always, always a surprise in the writing as, as per my quotes of the week, some, some great dialogue, um, great storytelling from, um, Shannon Gallant, uh, and, and co and, you know, while they're, you know, sort of, they, they were rushed. It, it's, it, you know, it's still all there, you know, it, it doesn't, there's not been a huge amount of taking shortcuts. Yeah. And, and sort of just such a different way of ending um <laughs> ending a series which is uh is finishing at the publisher with this you know cliffhanger excited to see where it will lead so i really uh, yeah really enjoyed it really enjoyed the last few issues and, and can't wait to see uh what happens next um i think that is us done this is a long old episode and i'm not going to cut it into two i think you'll call this an over length episode <laughs> idea uh so so next time on talking joe uh we will be continuing uh discussions of the devil's due era we've also got some uh, exciting interviews with various gi joe creatives coming up so that should be very cool and the countdown to issue 300 has concluded so uh we will be talking about the next issue of era uh when it comes out from the new publisher whoever that may be, whenever that may be. Do you think that the first issue will be all in part six? <laughs> Wouldn't that be wild? I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't either. <laughs> It'll be like, like after action, you know, consequences, part one, or, you know, the long road, part one, or the commander escapes again, part one. <laughs> okay T tim where can people find you uh, atomic abe and hub comics and a real american book dot com and uh you just recently published a great write-up of uh, assembly required convention on the blog so if you have any interest in that convention and finding out what sort of thing goes on there go on over to the a real american book website to find out what tim made of it Mark, where can people find you and us? Uh, you can find more about Talking Joe at the usual places, the main place being talkingjoe.co.uk, which is the website. We've got links from there to the Facebook groups, Twitter. Is it still about by the time this is published? Maybe. Um, Instagram and uh, all of that kind of thing. We're also on Patreon. So a big thanks to all of our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, Justin, Rob and Brian, who are getting early access to episodes as well as some other exclusive content. And that is us done. But remember that... Nobody beats Talking Joe, an international podcast! Laters. I just noticed that uh, Cobra Commander is on the cover twice. He's getting punched on the bottom, and he's also in his battle armor. No, he's getting punched in the face. Sorry, what did I say? You're saying he's getting punched on the bottom. <laughs> uh, he's getting punched on the bottom of the cover, and uh, a little more than halfway up, uh, on the back cover, close to the the edge, next to on the left side, next to Crockmaster, there is Battle Armor Cobra Commander. Or is it Fred? Oh right, okay, right. I'm sorry. Cut that. <laughs> Just cut that. <laughs> Bonus waffle. Congratulations, the seven of you.